The Pokemon trading card game, akin to the video games, are divided by generations. With each new generation comes new card design and new rules, but in this video, looking back at the first generation of Pokemon and take a look at the top cards that were used throughout this time. And at number 10, we have Wigglytuff. This colorless type stage 1 Pokemon has two attacks. The first is Lullaby. For one colorless energy, it can put your opponent's active Pokemon to sleep. And for three colorless energy, you can use Do the Wave, which does 10 damage plus 10 more damage for each of your bench Pokemon for a normal maximum of 60 damage. Evolved Pokemon typically weren't the standard during this time, as disruption in the form of energy removal and super energy removal meant that powerful attacks, such as Stage 2 Charizard's Energy Burn or Machamp's Seismic Toss, had a very difficult time getting to their attacks, as both required 4 energy. With Wigglytuff, you had both the advantage of the attack only costing 3 energy for potentially 60 damage, as well as double colorless energy helping you pay for 2 of those 3 energy. At the best of times, you can go first to have Jigglypuff and a single energy attached, and barring energy removal during your opponent's first turn, you could evolve and attach double colorless energy to immediately start attacking your opponent for 60 damage on the second turn. A massive amount of damage for this time in the game's history. Powerful Haymaker staples such as Hitmonchan, Scyther, and Electabuzz all only had 70 hit points as well. So matching Do the Wave with a plus power to further boost the attack by 10 damage meant you were one hit KOing the strongest Pokemon in the format without worry. Eventually, Wigglytuff became the main attacker in a deck called Trapper, where you would go first and string cards together such as Imposter's Oaks of Revenge, Rocket's Sneak Attack, and the Rocket's Trap to shuffle their entire hand into the deck and use Wigglytuff's Do the Wave in order to end the game as quickly as possible, usually winning by your opponent not having any remaining basic Pokemon. Despite this monster being really good, being an evolution put a damper on it, resulting in the card only receiving the 10th spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Dark Vile Plume. This is a stage 2 grass type Pokemon that has one Pokemon power and one attack. The power Hay Fever has the effect that neither player can activate trainer cards, but this power stops working while Dark Vile Plume is asleep, confused, or paralyzed. Petal Whirlwind for 3 grass energy can let you flip 3 coins, then do 30 damage times the number of heads. However, if you hit 2 or more heads, Dark Vile Plume became confused. Despite being a stage 2 with less HP than Wigglytuff, Dark Vileplume's interaction was never to attack. Instead, it's to sit on the bench and prevent your opponent from using trainer cards as soon as possible after you've already set up your attackers. Usually, these are in the form of Jungle Snorlax, who had the Body Slam attack for 30 damage for 4 colorless energy, with the ability to paralyze your opponent's active Pokemon if you landed a head on the coin flip. Paralyze in Pokemon DCG usually indicates by turning a Pokemon 90 degrees clockwise, makes it so the Pokemon affected cannot attack or retreat for one turn after becoming paralyzed. Then at the end of the turn, they return to normal. The other attack, Dark Golduck, is a stage 1 Pokemon that can do 50 damage with 2 Psychic and 1 Colorless Energy. Dark Golduck was usually paired with Dark Vileplume thanks to its pre-evolution, Fossil Psyduck, who for a Psychic Energy can attack with Headache, making it so your opponent can't play trainer cards during their turn, effectively locking them out before they can play the game. As during the time these cards were standard format legal, you could attack on your first turn. The way this was done most of the time was by using an Energy Attachment on an active Psyduck, then benching an Oddish for the next turn. Then, after the turn of your opponent activating trainer cards passes, you can use Pokemon Breeder, a card that allows you to put Stage 2 Evolution straight onto a basic Pokemon without needing to go into a Stage 1, bypassing Dark Gloom and setting up the lock one turn quicker. This made for a nearly unbeatable lock, if not for a single card introduced in Fossil, Muck. This card has the Pokemon power Toxic Gas, which says to ignore all Pokemon powers other than Toxic Gases, but this power stops working if Muck is asleep, confused, or paralyzed. As good as this counter was, Dark Vileplume could easily use cards like Rocket Sneak Attack to ensure your opponent never had a chance to set up Grimer for Muck to get on the field. So the only real way of getting past your opponent's powerful ability was to go first. And at number 8, we have Computer Search. This trainer card has the effect that you can discard two cards, search for any card from your deck, and put it into your hand. This extremely versatile searcher was played at maximum copies in just about every deck imaginable. And since you could search any card, you don't have to reveal that added card to your opponent. This ruling even remains today with standard format relevant cards, such as RCS V-Star, who can use the ability Star Birth to search any two cards from your deck and put them into your hand, but only once per game as the V-Star power rule prevents you from using more. With this card's versatility, it was useful in any situation you could find yourself in during any format in which it was legal. Need to remove energy from a powerful Pokemon on your opponent's side of the field? Simply search for Super Energy Removal to wipe two energy off of it at the cost of discarding one of your own attached energy cards. Need to bring one of your opponent's bench Pokemon back up to the active due to it being close to a KO? Search for Gust of Wind to bring it back into the active and knock it out for a prize card. Need to find multiple cards but don't have any resources? Use Computer Search to grab Professor Oak and get a brand new hand of 7 cards. This card was so powerful that when A spec card items were introduced during Gen 5's Black and White era, Computer Search was printed as 1, only allowing you to play one copy of your deck and locking it from using any other powerful A spec cards like Dowsing Machine which allowed you to discard two cards to add a trainer card back from your discard pile, a life due, 
which reduced the prize payout to KO by one prize, or Scoop Up Cyclone, allowing for a player to put one Pokemon and all cards attached to it back into their hand. Computer Search was versatile, but it only facilitated powerful plays rather than being the reason the plays existed, hence why it's lower in the countdown. And at number 7, we have Rocket Sneak Attack and Rocket's Trap. The former allows you to look at your opponent's hand, and if they have any trainer cards, choose one of them and shuffle it back into your opponent's deck. Whereas the latter has you flip a coin, and if heads, shuffle three random cards from your opponent's hand back into their deck. Now, it's nearly impossible to talk about these two cards separately, as they're usually shown up together in the same hand control strategies. While Rocket Sneak Attack was introduced in the Team Rocket expansion, it was played individually as a way to gain hand knowledge of your opponent's hand in order to make the most optimal bench plays, while also letting you know where to expend resources such as energy removal and plus power. Once the Rocket's Trap was introduced in the next set, Gym Heroes, it facilitated a full hand loop, or reducing your opponent's hand down to zero cards, with the help of a card called Imposter's Oak's Revenge, which has the effect to discard a card, then shuffle your opponent's hand into their deck and have them draw four cards. The combo starts by exhausting your copies of Erica, a card that would let you draw up to three cards, then allow your opponent to draw up to three cards as well. Then use Imposter's Oak's Revenge to shuffle all your opponent's now large hand back into the deck. From there, Rocket Sneak Attack would bring them down to three, assuming they have a trainer card. Then resolving a single Rocket's Trap would put them down to zero. Computer Search and Item Finder also help to ensure that if you hit Tails on a few Rocket Traps, you'd be able to get those last three cards out of your opponent's hand in due time. While most players would just use Wigglytuff to do the wave attack to end the game early, some players use Jungle Mankey and Peak Ability to look at the top card of your deck to ensure they wouldn't draw a card like Bill or Professor Oak to recover the resources. And at number 6, we have Jungle Lickitung. This basic colorless type Pokemon has two attacks. The first, Tongue Whip, for one colorless energy, does 10 damage and flips a coin. If heads, your opponent's Pokemon is not paralyzed. While the second, Supersonic, has you flip a coin, and if heads, your opponent's Pokemon is Confuse. Confusion nowadays isn't super special, as it only makes the Pokemon hit itself for 30 damage, if, on attack declaration, you flip Tails. But during the time Ligatung was standard format legal, Confusion had a slightly different effect. Instead of doing 30 damage, it only did 20, but it also affected retreating. The Pokemon that was attempting to retreat would first have to discard the required energy, then flip a coin to see if the retreat was successful. If heads, you can retreat as normal, and if tails, the retreat fails and your energy is discarded. This made Ligatung a very strong option for stall players looking to deck out their opponents, as Paralysis could stop attacks and Confusion could stop retreating in attacks, as many players weren't playing Switch during the time to evade Ligatung's deadly lock. The only downside to Ligatung during this time was a fighting weakness, as base at Himachan was seen a lot in the Haymaker strategy, doing 20 damage for one fighting energy, doubled to 40 thanks to weakness. However, during the same set Ligatung was introduced, Scyther was also added to the card pool, giving Ligatung the perfect partner to counter fighting type Pokemon thanks to a minus 30 resistance. Matched with cards like Pokemon Center, which heals all Pokemon on your side of the field completely, but to discard in all energy, and Scoop Up, allowing you to choose one of your Pokemon in play and return the basic Pokemon to the hand, discarding the rest, they made Lickitung a powerful choice to build a deck around. And at number 5, we have a three-way tie between base set Hitmonchan, Electabuzz, and Jungle Scyther. This trio Pokemon make up the center of the Haymaker strategy, and are rather difficult to separate as they all serve the same purpose for different typings. Hitmonchan is a basic fighting type Pokemon with two simple attacks. Jab requires one fighting energy for 20 damage, and Special Punch does 40 damage with two fighting energy and one colorless. Electabuzz is a basic lightning type Pokemon also with two attacks. Thundershock requires one lightning energy for 10 damage, then flips a coin of heads, paralyzes your opponent's active Pokemon, then for one lightning and one colorless, Thunder Punch does 30, then flips a coin. If heads does 10 more damage to your opponent's active Pokemon, if tails do 10 damage to Electabuzz. Then finally, Scyther is a basic grass type Pokemon, once again with two attacks. The first, Swords Dance, takes one grass energy and doubles Scyther's slash attack space damage to 60 rather than 30, then for three colorless energy, slash normally does 30 damage. All of these Pokemon have some really similar features in that they all have 70 HP and are basic, making them rather easy to fit together. With energy removal and super energy removal being such powerful cards during the time these Pokemon were standard legal, you needed a way to be able to attack over and over again without losing attack or energy attachment tempo, both of which were helped by the requirement of only one energy, while Scyther was the pivot Pokemon. Upon KO, players would choose Scyther due to the zero energy retreat cost, allowing them to assess the board on their turn, then decide whether or not to retreat into either Hitmonchan or Electabuzz depending on the situation. Hitmonchan hit Pokemon like Lickitung and Wigglytuff for weakness, while Electabuzz hit one of the other popular decks of the time for weakness, Rain Dance Blastoise. Blastoise was the only stage 2 Pokemon at the time that was sort of protected from energy removal, as the namesake Pokemon Power allowed for the player to attach a water energy to any water type Pokemon as many times as you like per turn. This trio countered just about everything in the base set, jungle, and fossil metagames, though one card that came out as a promo went above and beyond as a haymaker. 
And at number 4, we have the Wizards of the Coast promo, Mewtwo. This promo, handed out to attendees of the Pokemon the first movie in late 1999, is a basic Psychotic Pokemon with two attacks. The first, Energy Absorption, for one Psychic Energy, allows you to attach two Energy cards from your discard pile to Mewtwo, and for two Psychic, one Colorless, you can use Cyburn for 40 damage. While very similar to Electabuzz and Hitmonchan, Mewtwo was a very strong Pokemon that could also somewhat counteract energy removal by simply attaching more from the discard pile, getting back those that were either discarded off of cards like Professor Oak, Computer Search, or Item Finder, or the first turn to be much more aggressive with your resources, or from your opponent's energy removal or super energy removal to recoup the losses. It also hit for weakness on both itself and Hitmonchan, while also being able to two-hit KO both Scyther and Electabuzz, something most decks outside of Wigglytuff couldn't do before the release of this movie promo. Speaking of which, Mewtwo also paired nice with Wigglytuff to cover the fighting weakness the deck had, helping to force Haymakers out of the base set through Fossil metagame before the massive power creep that Team Rocket, Gym Heroes, and Gym Challenge provided. And at number 3, we have Bill. This is a trainer card that allows you to draw two cards. Bill is simply a consistency piece that helps any deck reach their win condition. All decks in the Pokemon TCG must be 60 cards, and digging for resources like Energy, Basic Pokemon, Evolved Pokemon, and Utility Cards is just key to winning a game. Playing Bill at 4 copies essentially makes any Pokemon TCG deck a 56 card deck, increasing consistency as Bill can usually always be activated except while under a trainer card lock. In other card games, getting what's known as a plus 1 in hand advantage, as you replace Bill with one card, then add another card by drawing it, usually gives you more resources to outmaneuver your opponent. Usually in Magic the Gathering, this is known as an instant, being able to counter an opponent's card during their turn with your own, and in Yu-Gi-Oh, there are quick effects that can be activated on monsters, spells, and traps, and negate effects or activations of cards. But with Pokemon, there isn't much utility outside of deck thinning, but that's good enough to make Bill a staple in just about every deck during the time in which it was standard legal. And at number 2, we have Professor Oak. This is a trainer card that allows you to discard your hand, then draw 7 cards. A very simple card with a powerful effect. Professor Oak was one of the 3 cards you'd see in every single deck, as it made any deck more consistent by just giving them access to more resources. While early in the game's history, during base set, jungle, and fossil, discard resources to occur new ones tended to be hyper-aggressive and too risky, as deck out was a common occurrence. Once the movie promo Mewtwo came out and the synergies of the discard pile emerged, Professor Oak became even heavier of an include, getting close to being at 3 copies in every deck. At the end of Generation 1, Professor Oak saw play in the previously mentioned Trapper deck, helping to turbo through your deck and find exactly Impostor's Oak's Revenge, Rocket Sneak Attack, and the Rocket's Trap and the basic Pokemon energy need to fill your attacks to end the game once your hand loop had been achieved. Despite discarding your whole hand sounding costly, three other cards help to recycle discarded resources if needed. In base set, Item Finder allows you to discard two cards and add a trainer card from your discard pile to your hand, so you can potentially reuse powerful staples like Professor Oak with a dead hand, Bill to draw extra cards, or energy removal to put your opponent back on attachment tempo. Also in this same set, Energy Retrieval allows a player to discard one card, then add two basic energy cards in the discard pile to their hand. While this prevents recycling of double colorless energy, it does give access to any type you want, whether it be water in Rain Dance Blastoise, Psychic with Mewtwo-centric decks, or fighting in Lightning for Haymaker strategies. Lastly, introducing Team Rocket was Nightly Garbage Run, a card that would let you choose three basic Pokemon, Evolve Pokemon or basic energy cards, and shuffle them back into your deck for later use. While the resources would end up in your deck, there were always copies of Computer Search or Item Finder for cards that would dig deeper into the deck to find them. This card was so powerful that nowadays it's found on the supporter card Professor's Research with the same text, but supporter cards can only be used once per turn, nor can you normally use any of the supporters the turn you activate one. But this card's spiritual successor still lives on in the modern game, one of the many reasons it's only number 2 on this list, as number 1 was so strong that it has never been printed again. And at number 1, we have both Energy Removal and Super Energy Removal. Both are trainer cards, with the first allowing you to choose one energy card attached to one of your opponent's Pokemon and discard it with no cost to you. While Super Energy Removal allows you to discard two energy cards, but the cost of discarding one energy card attached to one of your Pokemon. These two cards worked in tandem to ensure all Pokemon that needed three energy cards to attack would never have the chance to do so. Outside of Wigglytuff being able to use Double Colorless to pay for two of the three energy costs, and Mewtwo who could recoup the costs by attaching from the discard pile. Ever since these cards rotated out of standard format in 2001, they've never been considered to be printed again in their original forms. Many retrains have included needed variances and nerfs, such as Energy Removal 2 and Crushing Hammer. Both of these cards require a coin flip to perform Energy Removal, while the situationally useful Lost Remover and Enhanced Hammer remove one special energy from an opponent's Pokémon and puts it in either the Lost Zone or Discard Pile respectively. Guaranteed removal of energy from your opponent's Pokémon tends to be a no-no in Pokémon TCG card design nowadays though, as the only one currently standard format legal as of October 2022 is Crushing Hammer 
and the card rotates at the beginning of 2023. While very irritating to play against, both energy removal cards warp the Generation 1 format to be very skill-based, as these cards ensure that players needed to preserve their energy, considering cards like energy retrieval to get them back, or to not discard them with computer search or item finder. But the key word is warp, as these format warping cards did more to the game than anything else on this list, allowing to take the number one spot. In the Pokemon TCG, energy cards are usually required to use a Pokemon's attack, both in the form of basic energy for each of the game's types, and with special energy, which can have additional positive effects and or provide more than one unit of energy. However, you're only allowed to manually attach one energy card per turn. So in this list, we'll go over the best special energy cards used in Pokemon standard formats throughout the years. And at number 10, we have Double Dragon Energy. This energy can only be attached to a Dragon-type Pokemon, but in return can provide two of every type of energy, but only two at a time. While there haven't been many Dragon-type Pokemon printed, due to only being introduced as a new type in the TCG starting in Dragon's Exalted, Double Dragon Energy has still provided quite the utility to decks looking to resist the strong Mega Evolutions of the time, such as the new and extremely powerful Mega Rayquaza EX and the Emerald Break attack by providing two or four energy required on Giratina EX for Chaos Wheel. This attack does 100 damage and locks your opponent from activating Pokemon tools, attaching special energy, or using Stadium cards from their hand on their next turn. While it seems weak on its own, this was paired with the Max Elixir, allowing additional attachments from your deck to fuel the last two colorless energy needed for the attack requirement, and allowing you to not have to cram your deck full of basic grass and psychic type energy for a situationally good attacker. This combination of cards to help Shunto Satohiro win the 2016 World Championships in the Junior Division. Despite Double Dragon Energy fueling a very strong answer to X and Y's main multi-prize mechanic, it really only did this one job. Other special energy cards manage to do their one job either better than Double Dragon Energy or have more utility in multiple decks, resulting in the card only receiving the 10th spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Boost Energy. This is a card that has the effect of providing three units of colorless energy, but only on evolved Pokemon, and only for a single turn as it must be discarded at the end of the turn that it's attached. Despite these major downsides, Boost Energy saw heavy play in decks that required three colorless energy as part of their attack costs such as Gardevoir EX, which needed one Psychic and three Colorless to power Psystorm, an attack that does 10 damage times the number of energy attached to all Pokemon on the field. There's an important distinction here, as energy means that since Boost Energy provides three units of energy, that's an additional 30 damage done to the opponent, rather than if the attack said energy cards, in which case it would only do an additional 10 damage. This was an important card for the time, as it ensured that in the mirror match, you could hit for a massive amount of damage while ensuring your opponent didn't have much energy to add damage to your side of the board with. A few other decks could take advantage of the extra energy, such as Aquapolis Executor, but the heavy downsides, despite giving three units for one attachment, means it's not good enough to take a very high spot on this list. And at number 8, we have Double Turbo Energy. DTE has the ability to provide two units of colorless energy, but at the cost of reducing your Pokemon's damage output by 20 points. Since being printed in Brilliant Stars, DTE has been in many decks, as many Pokemon have colorless energy costs for attacks, and being able to get more than one unit of energy from attachment usually means it's a good card. As recent as the 2022 Peora Regional Championships, Double Turbo was seen at 4 copies per deck in 21 of the top 50 players at the event, as it can power up attacks in several key strategies revolving around Hisi and Zorag V-Star, Arceus V-Star, and Mew V-Max, as all of these decks feature Pokemon with energy cost of 2 colorless energy, powering them up in one turn. Despite only having been printed very recently as of recording this video, it has appeared in topping lists during nearly every regional, international, and world championship it's been standard legal for, and likely won't be changing soon. And at number 7, we have Rainbow Energy. This energy has the effect where it provides a single unit of any type of energy at the cost of doing 10 damage to the Pokemon it's attached to. This simple card helped many decks that wanted to play multiple types of Pokemon to be more consistent. As now, you didn't have to draw into both the attacker of choice and the energy that was needed to pay the attack cost, but rather the attacker and the rainbow energy. Originally printed in the fourth ever set in Team Rocket, rainbow energy was most often seen in Rainmaker strategies that use the movie promo Mewtwo as well as Hitmonchan for versatility in attackers and for hitting weaknesses on certain Pokemon, such as opposing Hitmonchans and Electabuzzes. While not as efficient as double colorless energy, as it only provided one energy, rainbow still provided a good amount of utility to these decks. However, Rainbow was printed not just during the base set era, but also saw play in the Heart Gold and Soul Silver era, namely in Ross Cawthon's 2011 World Championship winning deck known as The Truth, combining Dawn Fan's Prime's Earthquake attack to do 60 damage to your opponent's Pokemon, as well as 10 damage to your bench. Normally, this is a negative effect, 
but combined with Zekrom's Outrage attack, requiring double colorless energy for 20 damage, plus 10 for each damage counter in Zekrom, made for massive follow-up damage. And at number 6, we have Capture Energy. This energy has the effect where it provides one unit of colorless energy, but when attached, can search your deck for a basic Pokemon and put it directly into your bench. This is a really strong effect that increases consistency in a number of strategies. As turn 1, during the Sword and Shield era, you're unable to use supporter cards during that turn. So gaining added consistency and send up your utility Pokemon with Sobble for future shady dealings or various attackers, while also paying for a portion of a beater's attack cost, can help to provide decks who need the added consistency with easy access to their plays. One of the main decks that uses Capture Energy the most is Astral Radiance Regigigas, whose effect Ancient Wisdom required a combination of all six Regi monsters out in play to be alive, which has the incredible effect of allowing you to attach any three energy cards from your discard pile to any one Pokemon once per turn as long as you had its activation conditions met. By combining this, Ultra Ball and Quick Ball, two other cards that allowed you to search out more Regi cards, Regigigas players had to combine 12 ways of accessing their monsters without having to hard draw all of them, making a deck that relies on having six individual monsters out at the same time rather consistent despite the inconsistent sounding premise. And at number five, we have Strong Energy. This energy has the effect that it provides one unit of fighting energy and makes the Pokemon Strong Energy is attached to do 20 more damage, but it can only be attached to a fighting type Pokemon. While semi-niche, Strong Energy helped enable many mid-level attackers to yield the damage necessary to put previous metagame threats on notice. Generally, you want to be KOing your opponent's Pokemon in a profitable way, and damage modifiers tend to help in that department, especially when the only thing a deck is missing is hitting a certain damage threshold to KO certain meta-warping Pokemon. One of the most recent examples was Power Tablet, a card that allows your Fusion Strike Pokemon to do an additional 30 damage to your opponent's active Pokemon. This helped facilitate damage thresholds in Mew VMAX decks, as their signature boss monster's attack, Cross Fusion Strike, copies a bench Fusion Strike Pokemon's attack. This normally is either Genesect V Technoblast for 210 damage, or Meloetta's Melodious Echo for 70 damage times the number of Fusion Strike energy attached to all of your Pokemon, usually also being 210 thanks to the supporter card Elisa Sparkle attaching two Fusion Strike energies from your deck, along with a third from a manual attachment. These both would hit just shy of knocking out key Pokemon V, such as Arceus, Duraludon, and Galarian Moltres. But thanks to Power Tablet, you were able to not only hit these Pokemon V for one-hit knockouts, but by stacking multiple Power Tablet, you can hit damage thresholds like 280 for knockouts of top-tier V-Star Pokemon, like Arceus and Origin Form Palkia, or 310 for powerful three-prize VMAX Pokemon, like Jolteon or Umbreon. While Strong Energy saw play alongside numerous fighting types, like Hawlucha, Lycanroc GX, Donphan, and Primal Grodon, two decks in particular saw heavy meta representation and eventual World Championship tops due to the extra power from Strong Energy. Landorus EX revolved around using this card paired with Fighting Stadium, which provided an extra 20 damage on top of Strong Energy, which in itself could stack and make sure that Landorus could attack for consistent two-hit KOs across the board, with the help of Phantom Force's Crobat to do spread damage. Buzzwall GX didn't have Fighting Stadium help with additional damage, though Regirock EX with the ability Regi Power acted as half of the stadium, providing an extra 10 damage to your fighting Pokemon, ensuring that Buzzwall could profitably prize trade with opponents that were attempting to evolve into their GX boss monsters of choice, especially with the prominence of the Fighting Weak Zorak GX due to its trade-in ability. And at number 4, we have Double Rainbow Energy. This energy has the effect where it provides any type of energy, but only two at a time in any combination, with that Pokemon that's attached to doing 10 less damage after applying weaknesses and resistance modifiers. Being released in March 2004 in the EX Team Magma vs. Team Aqua expansions, a strong 2 for 1 in terms of attachment was very rare ever since Double Colorless Energy, though despite it seemingly being a power creep version of the original Rainbow Energy, this was balanced through only being usable by evolved Pokemon making it so basic Pokemon and Pokemon EX were unable to harness this strong attack fuel option. However, decks that could take advantage of double rainbow energy made for strong contenders, ranging from EX Ruby and Sapphire Guardivar, which does 10 damage times the amount of energy on both Guardivar and your opponent's defending Pokemon, essentially mitigating the slight downside of double rainbow, all the way to Diamond and Pearl and Polion, fueling the entirety of an Aqua Jet attack by your second turn when matched with Water Energy Attachment and a Rare Candy to evolve from Piplup and straight into Empoleon. Likely the most successful deck that played Double Rainbow was Queen Dom, a Nidoqueen and Pidgeot focused deck that won the 2005 World Championship by helping fuel Nidoqueen's Power Lariat in attack with one fighting and two colorless does 40 damage plus 10 damage for each evolved Pokemon that you have in play, giving additional utility to Pidgeot, whose Pokey Power allows you to search for any one card from your deck and put it into your hand, giving the deck a rock solid resource loop. However, this card wasn't the best when it came to stage one and stage two strategies, 
as another very strong energy card beats this one out by a bit. And at number three, we have Scramble Energy. This energy has the effect where it provides a single unit of colorless energy, but if you have more prizes left than your opponent, it can provide three of any type of energy in any combination. This extremely powerful effect was, akin to the previous entry, only limited to evolved Pokemon, incentivizing the usage of Stage 1 and 2 decks. Scramble Energy also provided something not directly written on the card, that being the threat of an instant power-up of any attacker on the bench. So it was important during the years this card was standard legal to ensure you set up effectively before taking prizes. Otherwise, your opponent would have an easy recovery option without expending many resources. In fact, this is one of the reasons players say that the EX format of the time requires much skill, as you have to pick the time to break the stalemate and activate your opponent's dormant scramble energy. One of the strongest decks that took advantage of this was known as Rai Eggs, revolving around Delta Raichu and Delta Executor, both exploiting heavy reliance on Poke Powers, a common occurrence during the spring and summer of 2006, and forcing opponents to walk into Scramble Energy's activation requirement, giving it enough power necessary to win the US National Championship that year. One of the most powerful decks Scramble Energy helped to enable was known as Bomb Tar, an Electro EX and Dark Tyranitar focus strategy that revolved around using Electrode's extra energy bomb attack to KO itself and attach five energy cards from the discard pile to your Pokemon in any way you'd like, including special energy, both giving your opponent the prize advantage to power Scramble Energy and powering up multiple threats at the same time. Scramble Energy even saw success going into the Diamond and Pearl era, as while paired with Gallade and Gardevoir from Secret Wonders, this card could single-handedly power up either of their strongest attacks in order to take knockouts quickly and effectively while locking your opponent out of using Poke Powers with the latter. However, the stalemate still occurred, so in order to break said stalemates, Jirachi EX was used as an additional way to force your opponent out of Poke Powers by using Shield Beam, an attack which disabled your opponent's bench Pokemon from using powers, forcing the need for a knockout as without Poke Powers, it's very difficult to set up your attackers for later in the game. This would force your opponent to expend more resources than normal while also feeling the requirement for Scramble Energy, manipulating the resource trade and eventually allowing you to pull ahead on the prize trade and win the game. And at number 2, we have Call Energy. This card has the effect where it provides colorless energy, then, once during your turn, if the Pokemon Call Energy is attached to is in the active spot, you may search your deck for up to two basic Pokemon and put them onto your bench. Then, end your turn if you do. Now, this card was seen in just about every deck during the four main standard formats that it was legal from 2008 to 2011, as during this time, supporter cards were not allowed to be played on turn 1 so the first turn player would usually have less resources to rely on in order to get their plays going. Despite the downside of ending your turn, Call Energy gave access to the player going first just as powerful plays without a supporter, as this could search more Pokemon than once per turn supporters, like Celio's Network or Bebe's Search, and just as many as Roseanne's Research. In addition, since you're unable to attack going first, you would only activate Call Energy as the last action of your turn, making the downside have minimal impact. While Call Energy does diminish its usefulness the longer a game goes, it still provides a single unit of colorless energy, a requirement that just about every useful attacker in the game at this time had as part of the attack cost, such as Mewtwo Level X, Stormfront Machamp, and Secret Wonders Gallade, to name a few. Despite being able to bench Pokemon like Baltoy for Cosmic Power Claydol plays to draw cards, or the basic Pokemon that your main attacker revolves around, it isn't the best special energy around simply due to only being printed one time. And finally, at number one, we have Double Colorless Energy. This card is very simple but very powerful, being a single energy attachment that provides two units of colorless energy. The act of getting two energy from one attachment was extremely powerful during the first few sets of the game, where Double Colorless was the only card that could provide more than one unit until the release of Miracle Energy in the Neo Destiny expansion, three years after Double Colorless Energy was first released in the base set. DCE, as it's often abbreviated, was played with numerous strategies at the time, as Charizard could use it to power up its Fire Spin in two turns, using its Pokemon Power Energy Burn to turn them into Fire Energy. Chansey could either use one to power its Scrunch, a move that allows you to flip a coin, and if heads, prevent all effects including damage done to Chansey while it's on the active spot, or two to use Double Edge, a powerful move with 80 base damage that KOs many strong Pokemon at the time, such as the popular Haymaker trio of Scyther, Electabuzz, and Hitmonchan. The base set era wasn't the only time this card was printed though, as DCE saw reprints in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, Next Destinies, XY Base Set, Phantom Forces, Fates Collide, Evolutions, Sun and Moon Base Set, and Guardians Rising, seeing play in every format it appeared. In fact, DC appeared in at least one World Championship winner's deck every year it was legal for standard tournament play from 2010 to 2018. 
World Championship decks are card-for-card -card proxy decks for the World Championship or runner-ups from any of the juniors, seniors, or master division. So seeing them in this many of the game's top strategies tends to be a good indicator of a card's power. So for being an excellent card that broke the boundaries of only one energy card attachment per turn by providing two, it's no wonder this card has seen such heavy competitive play that it would find its way in nine years worth of World Championship decks as one of the strongest attachment options in the game. And that's why it makes it to the first slot of this list. Ditto V is a Pokemon with the unique ability, V Transformation, which allows it to swap itself with another Pokemon V in your discard pile. This led to a plethora of Pokemon being used in conjunction with Ditto V to allow for some crazy and versatile combos. And in this video, we'll be going over some of the best targets for Ditto V. And at number 10, we have Vikavolt V from the Darkness of Blaze expansion. Vikavolt V is a basic 210 HP lightning Pokemon with two attacks. The first is Paralyzing Bolt. This attack costs one lightning energy and one colorless energy and does 50 damage while leaving your opponent unable to play items during their next turn. The main selling point of Vikavolt V is the Paralyzing Bolt attack. Item Lock has always been very strong in Pokemon. Cards like Seismitoad EX from the XY Furious Fist and Trevenant from XY Base Set, both of which saw success during their times in the standard format, had similar abilities. Vigavolt V also had the merit of being a lightning type Pokemon. This is a benefit against Palkia V Star as it has the weakness of lightning type, allowing for Vigavolt V to do two times damage. Having a favorable matchup against the best deck in the format is always a great thing and sets you up for success. Your primary focus with Vigavolt V is to use Paralyzing Bolt as many times as possible. Tittle V helps you accomplish this by allowing you to get back your Vigavolt V once it gets knocked out to continue preventing your opponent from playing items and slowly wielding down your opponent's active Pokemon's HP in the process. And at number 9, we have Raikou V from the Brilliant Stars expansion. Raikou V is a lightning type basic Pokemon with 200 HP. It has one attack, Lightning Rondo, which deals 20 damage plus 20 more damage for each Pokemon on both players' benches. Being a lightning type allows for easy one-hit knockouts on the ever-so-dominant Palkia V-Star. It also shares the ability Fleet-Footed with Suicune V and Entei V. This ability allows you to draw one card once per turn while the Pokemon is in the active spot. While this may seem like nothing, the one extra card is always nice to have. Similarly to Vigavolt V, Raikou V is also a lightning type, which means it does two times the damage to Palkia V-Star. This is excellent because Palkia V-Star's damage depends on the amount of bench Pokemon in play. Fortunately, Raikou V also requires a large amount of Pokemon to be in play to be able to do more damage. Since most Palkia V-Star decks will have a full bench during the majority of the game, Raikou V is able to attack for ridiculous amounts of damage thanks to Palkia V-Star having weakness to lightning types. Using Ditto V, you're able to recycle Raikou V and get it back to take another one-hit knockout on Palkia V-Star. And at number 8, we have the excellent Ninetales V from Rebel Clash expansion. Ninetales V is a very interesting card with the Ninetale Shapeshifter attack, which allows you to pick an attack on your opponent's active Pokemon and use it as this attack. It costs 1 Fire Energy and 2 Colorless Energy, making it very easy to power up using double Turbo Energy. It also has the attack Flamethrower, costing 1 Fire and 3 Colorless, that discards 1 Energy from an opponent's active Pokemon and does 130 damage. The main reasons Ninetales V is good is because of its Ninetale Shapeshifter attack. There are many amazing attacks you can copy in the standard format, such as Arceus V-Star's Trinity Nova, which allows you to search your deck for three basic energy cards and attach them to your V-Pokemon any way you like. Or Palkia V-Star's Subspace Well, which does 60 damage plus an additional 20 damage for each bench Pokemon in play. Ditto V allows you to recycle your Ninetales V to continue copying your opponent's attacks as long as you have ways to get the energy back onto your Ninetales V, which can be accomplished, like the aforementioned, just copying Trinity Nova from Arceus V-Star. And at number 7, we have Unknown V from the brand new Silver Tempest expansion. This card has two attacks, one of which is very unique. Its first attack, Shady Stamp, is nothing special, doing a small 30 damage and leaving your opponent's active Pokemon confused for one psychic energy. Its second attack, Victory Symbol, is what I think makes this card great. Victory Symbol costs three colorless energy and allows you to win the game if you have one prize remaining. This is an incredibly strong attack because, well, it has the unique condition to win you the game immediately. You can meet this condition in a variety of different ways as long as you map out how you'll get down to one prize remaining. As this card is something that you want to use in the late game, sometimes you might have to discard it early. And that's where Ditto V comes into play to help you get back so you can actually win the game. By using Ditto V, we can always have access to it as long as it's in the discard pile, and we have three energy attached to use the attack. And at number 6, we have Medicham V from Battle Styles expansion. This card is one that at a glance doesn't seem too strong. Only being able to do 20 damage anywhere on the board with its Yoga Loop attack, or 100 with its Smash Uppercut for 3 energy. The main selling point for Medichan V is the effect Yoga Loop, which allows you to place two damage counters on one of your opponent's Pokemon. And if you take a knockout with those two damage counters, you get to take an extra turn. You also cannot use Yoga Loop two turns in a row. This is an extremely versatile and strong effect for an attack as it allows you to take an extra turn, which allows you to reuse once per turn abilities, such as Inteleon's Quick Shooting which allows you to place two free damage counters on one of your opponent's Pokemon each turn. It also allows you to play another supporter, 
as it is now a new turn where the supporter has not been played yet. And seeing as these cards are bounced around only being able to use one per turn, getting a second one immediately after using another one is just premium advantage. Furthermore, you can evolve Pokemon that were put into play in the previous turn that you use Yoga Loop. Playing this card with Ditto V allows you to get back Metacham V at any point, thanks to its ability, and pull off the combo whenever you need it. And at number 5, we have Galarian Moltres V from Chilling Rain Expansion. This card is an extremely versatile card that fits right in with Ditto V. With a solid 220 HP, a fantastic ability, and a great attack, this card has it all. Its ability, Dire Flame Wings, allows you to attach one dark energy from your discard pile to it once per turn. This is an excellent ability, as it allows you to slowly power up your Galarian Moltres V each turn. Its attack for two darkness energy and one colorless, or a burn, does 190 damage, but you do 30 damage to yourself. Moltres pairs well with Ditto V because of the card Energy Switch. Since its ability allows you to accelerate one energy from the discard pile, you can use Energy Switch to move that to another Pokemon on the board. By doing this, you can power up other attacks that might be better in specific scenarios, such as Vigavolt V or Arceus V. Ditto V allows you to get back attackers that you might want for any scenario, and Galarian Moltres V helps power up those attacks. To me, that sounds like a match made in heaven. And at number 4, we have Galarian Zapdos D from the Chilling Rains expansion as well. This card saw lots of places it came out because of its fantastic ability, Fighting Instinct, which reduces this Pokemon's attack cost by one colorless energy for each Pokemon V your opponent has in play. This is amazing with its attack Thunderous Kick, which costs one fighting energy and three colorless energy to deal 170 damage and a light discard a special energy attached to your opponent's active Pokemon before doing any damage. The main reason this card saw so much success was because it was able to efficiently attack for one fighting energy, and is a fighting type that was able to one-hit knock out many of the fighting weak Pokemon that were good at the time, such as Eternatus VMAX and Arceus V-Star. Ditto V allowed you to recycle your Zapdos to take two knockouts on Eternatus VMAX in the matchup, and allows you to trade knockouts efficiently with Arceus V-Star decks. And at number 3, we have Empoleon V from Battle Styles Expansion. This card was not played very much before, but has since become a very strong card with the release of Comfy from Lost Origins. Empoleon V has a very strong ability, Emperor's Eye, and the attack Swirling Slice that does 130 damage and moves an energy from Empoleon to a bench Pokemon. This ability shuts down the abilities of all non-rulebox Pokemon as long as Empoleon V is active. This is a very strong ability right now as it shuts down Comfy and Cramorant. Both of these cards are very, very strong cards in any Lost Zone engine deck, and Empoleon V's ability to shut both of them down prevents any Lost Zone deck from setting up and applying early pressure with Cramorant. As strong as Empoleon V is, they can sometimes just knock out Empoleon V and continue to set up with Comfy. So Ditto V allows you to get your Empoleon V back and stick it back in the active slot to slow down your opponent to keep setting up your own board as they struggle to do anything. And at number 2, we have Arceus V. Arceus is a highly versatile card with two attacks. The first being Trinity Charge for two colorless energy, which allows you to search your deck for three energy and attach them to your Benji V Pokemon in any way you like. It also has Power Edge for three colorless energy that does 130 damage. It also evolves into the oh-so-powerful Arceus V-Star. Now, you may be wondering, how is Arceus V the second best target for Ditto V? The main goal for any Arceus V-Star deck is to get Arceus V-Star into play on your second turn of the game. Having a Ditto V makes it so that if your Arceus V gets knocked out, you can use V Transformation and evolve your now Arceus V into a V-Star, as long as the Ditto V has been in play for one turn. Having Ditto V as an option essentially allows you to play more than four copies of Arceus V in your deck, and also lets you get back any of your tech attackers that might have been knocked out or discarded earlier in the game. And speaking of tech attackers, that leads into our number one spot. And at the number one spot, we have Drapion V from the Lost Origins expansion. Not to be confused with Drapion V from Vivid Voltage, this Drapion has an extremely powerful ability and powerful attack that allows it to be splashed into any deck to help counter the dominant Mew V Max. Drapion has the Wild Style ability, which reduces attack cost by one colorless energy for each single Rapid or Fusion Strike Pokemon your opponent has in play. It also has the attack Dynamic Tail, which does 190 damage to your opponent's active Pokemon while dealing 60 to one of your own Pokemon. That being paired with its Dark Typing makes it perfect for knocking out a Mew VMAX because of Mew's weakness to Dark Types. Since the Mew VMAX deck plays all Fusion Strike Pokemon, it allows Drapion V to attack freely if they have four Fusion Strike Pokemon in play. This card single-handedly is the best counter to any Mew VMAX deck because of its ability, typing, and attack. Ditto V allows you to get back Drapion V to be able to take a second knockout on a Mew VMAX, allowing you to take your three remaining prize cards. Delta Species Pokemon were an extremely reasonable mechanic, simply being new versions of Pokemon with unique typings, such as Metal-type Pikachu, as well as having other synergies, often with each other. In this list, we're looking at some of the strongest of this unique Pokemon type. And at number 10, we have Chimeco from EX Hole and Phantoms. Chimeco is an extremely basic card, with a pretty bland attack. Its main draw was its Delta support Pokepower, 
which allowed you to, once per turn, return any basic energy or delta rainbow energy from your discard pile to your hand, as long as you had a hole in support card next to your active Pokemon, which effectively translates to having played one during that turn. At the time, the Hole and Supporter cards were a trainer-based engine centered around making decks more consistent. This engine was played in almost every deck at the time, largely thanks to the combined strength of Hole on Mentor, which allowed you to set up your basic Pokemon in the early game, and Hole on Transceiver, a trainer card that was used to find Hole and Mentor early enough for it to matter. While Chimeco was not played in every single deck that played the Hole on engine, Chimeco saw play in a variety of decks during the EX era, which is a term that describes the third generation of the Pokemon TCG that was the focus of the competitive play from the 2004 to 2007 format, largely in decks that heavily valued having their energy attached every turn or in decks that used the Delta Rainbow energy. Two of the most well-known decks that featured Chimeco were LBS, or Lugia Blastoise Steelix, which was one of the most dominant decks in the 2006 format, and Argon, which was one of the best performing rogue decks of all time in the late 2007. While Chimeco never saw world championship level success, the card saw regular play throughout its legality, earning itself a spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Latios EX from the EX Dragon Frontiers expansion. Much like Chimeco, Latios finds its place on this list thanks to its use as a tech card. Throughout the 2007 season, Pokemon EX were the core attackers of almost every competitive strategy. And as a result, Latios' Ice Barrier, which makes it immune to attacks from Pokemon EX during the following turn, proved to be an exceptional counter to all of the EX heavy strategies. In particular, decks like a deck known as Flycaddy, which was based around Flygon EX from EX Legend Maker, and Delcaddy from EX Power Keepers, used it pretty frequently as a method of dealing with some of the Pokemon EX that could give it problems. In addition, Latios sees a fair amount of play in EX era tournaments that happened in the modern era as a counter to Arcanine EX decks that have been a consistent present in the format. While Ice Barrier is strong, the card is equally strong for its Link Wing Pokebody, which gives itself and any other Latios or Latias that you might have in play a retreat cost of zero. This proves to be convenient for not just turning itself into a pivot, but allowing you to easily retreat Latias from EX Holden Phantoms, which shuts off the Pokemon bodies of non-EX Pokemon as long as Latios or Latios EX is in play. In fairness, Latias is probably equally deserving to spawn this list, as many of the decks that played Latios EX played Latias, but due to its applications with Ice Barrier and a broad group of decks, Latios gets to take this spot instead. And at number 8 on this list, we have Raichu from EX Hole on Phantoms. At the time of its release, Raichu was not seen as a particularly strong card. Both of its attacks appeared to be reasonably strong, but still just a little underpowered in comparison to some of the titans of the format. Zap, which does 20 damage to each Pokemon in play with the Poke Power or Poke Body, was seen as a decent spread attack in the right deck, but far from exceptional. On the other hand, Metallic Thunder just does 50 damage, but it allows you to choose to discard 2 Metal Energies to make it do 90 damage instead. At the time, there was no basic metal energy yet, as it was not introduced until Diamond and Pearl. So Raichu was reliant on exclusively special energy if it wanted to pay its attack costs. And with the difficulty of accelerating special energy, there was no great way to reliably power up Raichu. However, things would all change for Raichu around the 2006 US National Championships. Shortly before the event, one player gave two of their friends a deck that combined Raichu and Executor from EX Delta Species, claiming that the deck had the potential to be a strong play for the tournament. While the deck's creator would ultimately do quite poorly with the deck, the other two players would both make it to the finals of the tournament, with the champion being the first and only undefeated US national champion in Pokemon TCG history. What changed for Raichu? Well, nothing. The card had just been significantly underestimated as a synergy with Executor that had not been considered, but the partnership proved to be incredibly strong, and thus, the Ryeggs was born. Ryeggs saw scattered play throughout the rest of its legality, but it never did end up putting another result comparable to its performance at the US National Championship. With that being said, the legendary performance alone was more than enough to make its legacy one of the most powerful decks in the EX era, cementing Raichu's place at number 8 on this list. And at number 7, we have Mew Star from EX Dragon Frontiers. Pokemon Star were a unique gimmick mechanic in the later half of the EX era that featured shiny Pokemon which you could only play one of in your deck total. But this came with the promise of extremely strong attacks, Poke Powers, and Poke Bodies. While many of the Pokemon Star mostly failed to deliver on that promise, Mew Star was one that certainly was able to deliver. While both of its attacks were strong, the most frequently used attack was Rainbow Wave, which lets you choose a basic energy type attached to Mew Star in order to do 20 damage to all of your opponent's Pokemon of the same type. This saw major play in two different decks during its legality, but for different purposes. The first of this was Argon in 2007, which played a variety of different basic energy, allowing Rainbow Wave to be relevant against a multitude of strategies. On the other hand, Empoleon decks used the card in 2008 as attack for the mirror match to spread damage to opposing Empoleon. Speaking of mirror matches, Mewstar's Mimicry attack was also strong in the Empoleon mirror, among other matchups, as it allows you to copy an attack of any of your opponent's Pokemon, 
as long as you have the necessary energy to use that attack. Oftentimes you'll be unable to meet this requirement, but in a mirror match, you almost can always do so because you're playing the same energies as your opponent. Mimicry was also used in the aforementioned Argon deck sometimes, as you played multiple Delta Energy Rainbows so that you can use any attack you wanted with Mimicry. Mewstar never became the world champion in the Master Division with a peak performance of a top 4, but it achieved the title in the Seniors Division, which is for players that are approximately 11 to 14 years old, in 2008, which is more than enough success to put on a spot on this list. And at number 6, we have Executor from EX Hole on Phantoms. As the other spot of the right eggs deal that was mentioned with the right earlier on in this list, it should already be quite clear why Executor is on this list. However, while right eggs was pretty much the full story for Raichu, it wasn't the full story for Executor. Thanks to the strength of Delta Circle, which does 10 damage plus 10 more damage for each Delta species Pokemon that you have in play, and Split Bomb, which does 30 damage to two of your opponent's Pokemon in play, Executor found itself as an incredible multi-purpose attacker in 2006 and 2007. In 2007 in particular, it also saw play in some versions of the Argon deck as a fighting type attacker, as well as being a generally formidable attacker against the decks where the fighting type is less important. As a result of these more broad applications, in addition to being a viable threat for longer than Raichu was, Executor easily makes it at number 6 on the list. And at number 5, we have Metagross from the EX Delta Species. While many of the previous cards were reasonably strong, Metagross marks the beginning of the cards that are truly exceptional on this list. At first glance, Metagross has a lot going on with a strong attack and even stronger Pokebody. But the other standout aspect of the card is that it's the first on this list to be a dual type Pokemon. In addition to Delta Species Pokemon typically being a different type than usual, some of them are also partially metal types in addition to other type. Coincidentally, Metagross is normally a metal type Pokemon, but this does not apply for all of the dual type Delta Species Pokemon. As for its Poke Power, Delta Control allows you to look at the top four cards of your deck and then choose one to put in your hand while putting the other three in the bottom of your deck. This Poke Power was an exceptional consistency boost for the Meta Knight archetype, which was a combination of Metagross as well as Dragonite, as trying to accomplish getting out the 4 to 5 stage 2s that the deck needed to function would have been nearly impossible otherwise. In the Meta Knight deck, Metagross doubled as being the deck's main attacker, with Crush and Burn dealing 30 damage plus 20 more damage for each enemy card that you discarded from your Pokemon in play. At this time, this level of damage output from Pokemon that was not a Pokemon EX was nearly unheard of, and quickly catapulted Meta Knight to being one of the strongest decks in both the 2006 and 2007 format, putting up many top level results at each year's national and world championships. And at number 4, we have Flygon EX from EX Dragon Frontiers. In the late EX era, there were a series of several extremely strong Flygon cards, with two of the stronger ones being Delta Species Pokemon. While both of them could be considered to be equally deserving of the spot, as they were both pretty reliant on the other to be good, Flygon EX was a far more critical part of the decks that played it, so it will be the focus of this spot. Flygon EX dominated the 2007 format as one of the most potent ways to spread damage across the board thanks to the incredible strength of its Psychic Pulse attack, which does 80 damage and 10 damage to each of your opponent's bench Pokemon. The strength of this attack is made a bit more clear with the understanding of Flygon's Pokebody, Sand Damage, which places one damage counter on each of your opponent's bench basic Pokemon between turns, which allows you to get damage spread on the board early and then keep racking it up throughout the game. Some players also paired this card with Jolteon EX, which places one damage counter on each of your opponent's Pokemon upon evolving into Jolteon, allowing the damage to rack up even faster. This strategy was so powerful that it won the World Championship in the Junior Division in 2007, cementing Flygon EX's place in the history books. And at number 3, we have Sceptile EX from EX Crystal Guardians. Sceptile's place in history is a bit unique because, while the card never produced an exceptional result at a major tournament like the World Championships, the card is almost universally considered to be one of the most powerful Delta Species Pokemon ever printed. Its extra liquid Poke Power makes it so that Pokemon EX cannot use Poke Powers, and it costs an extra energy for them to attack, acting as an extremely powerful disruption tool against strategies heavily based around Pokemon EX. As a result of this disruption, Sceptile EX is also able to make its own attack, Power Revenge, which does 60 damage plus 10 more damage for each prize card that your opponent has taken. A bit stronger, as in the late game, when the attack is the strongest, it's typically quite difficult for your opponent to produce an adequate answer given the constraints of Power Liquid. However, it must be noted that, despite the attack cost saying it's one Psychic and one Colorless Energy, it is effectively one Psychic and two Colorless Energy, as Power Liquid applies to Sceptile EX itself as well. Sceptile EX saw play in numerous strategies in 2007, from Argon to Meta Knight and everything in between. And at number 2, we have Dragonite from EX Delta Species. Not surprisingly, the other half of the Meta Knight duo also appears on this list. Unlike Metagross, Dragonite was strong for Meta Knight almost exclusively thanks to its Delta Charge Poke Power, which attached a lighting energy from your discard pile to one of your bench Pokemon. Reminiscent to Blaziken from EX Ruby and Sapphire, which was then considered one of the strongest decks of the entire EX era, many players immediately saw potential for Dragonite's Pokebody, as it was nearly identical. 
As expected, they were correct, and the card proved to be exceptional in Meta Knight decks, as it proved to be one of the most powerful and iconic decks of the entire EX era, being a dominant force in the metagame for its entire legality. However, Dragon Knight did not just see success in the Meta Knight archetype, as there were a handful of other strategies, such as one that used Electivire, that players created later on that would prove to be quite powerful with Dragon Knight as well. Finally, at the number one spot on our list, we have Rayquaza EX from EX Delta Species. Between its strong attacks and stronger Pokebody, Rayquaza EX is an absolute powerhouse when compared to most of the other Delta Species Pokemon. Its first attack, Delta Circuit, deals 30 damage to any of your opponent's Pokemon for just a lightning energy and a colorless energy, but this is upgraded to 50 damage if the target Pokemon has a Poke Power or a Poke Body. Its second attack is a bit less interesting, however, just doing 70 damage for two lightning and two colorless energy. Most of the time, this attack would never be used, but thanks to its Pokebody Rage Aura, removing all colorless energy from Rayquaza EX's attack costs as long as you have more prize cards remaining than your opponent, both attacks become extremely powerful and energy efficient options. During its legality, several decks made use of this powerful Pokemon, but no deck did so as well as the World Championship deck in 2007. Rayquaza EX is even stronger in an alternative format, simply called the EX Era format, that uses all of the cards that were printed in the EX Era. While this format did not exist at the time in the TPCI rating zones such as Europe or the United States, it was the format in Japan at the time, and as a result it has seen an uptick in popularity in the modern era as a fun format to revisit. In that format, it is a key component of a deck known as Railer, which is considered by many to be the absolute best deck in that format. The result of this card was able to produce during its brief legality made an easy case for Rayquaza EX being the absolute best Delta Species Pokemon of all time. At their core, item cards are the easiest to use cards as there's no restriction on how many of them you can use per turn, unlike stadiums and supporters, of which you can only play one per turn. As this video will include some cards from pre-black and white, we will consider every of those unrestricted trainer cards as items except A specs, as those will be featured in a different video. In its 10th place is a card that's very unique in its use, but has actually been around ever since the base set, at least concept-wise. Lily's Pokedoll from Cosmic Eclipse can be put into play just like a Pokemon card, but if it should be knocked out, your opponent doesn't take any prize cards. This can be very effective to buy some turns when your opponent isn't able to target any of your bench Pokemon to attack them, or even as an entire strategy by itself where you try to get back your Lily's Pokedolls infinitely to prevent your opponent from closing out the game by taking 6 prizes. This card was most prominently paired with Florges from Forbidden Light with its Wondrous Gift ability. This ability allows you to flip a coin, and, if heads, put an item card back on top of your deck. Since this ability wasn't limited to once per turn, you could simply set up multiple Florges to get up to 4 flips and increase your chances to get back your Lily's Pokedoll for the next turn, and just put it active again after the previous one was knocked out. As previously mentioned, this was not the first time that a card like this was introduced to the Pokemon TCG. Clefairy Doll from base set was the first ever item card that worked like a Pokemon in play that didn't give up any prize cards. An interesting part about this card is that unlike Lily's Pokedoll, it couldn't be affected by any special conditions, something that should rarely matter on a card with 10 HP, but still worth noting the difference. Another card that worked similarly to the previous two was Robo Substitute from Phantom Forces. It provided 20 more HP than Clefairy Doll, matching Lily's Poke Doll at 30 HP, and also could be affected by special conditions just like it. The big difference is that Lily's Poke Doll, apart from the other two cards, was that if you didn't have any use for it anymore, you could just put it back at the bottom of your deck instead of having to be discarded like the other two cards. This might not seem like a lot, but being able to conserve a card that's meant to frustrate your opponent was an immense advantage. Interestingly enough, there is also another category of item card Pokemon that used to work very similar to these cards. Up until Diamond and Pearl, any of the fossil cards that would be used to evolve into reanimated Pokemon from the video games also didn't count as knocked out Pokemon, meaning that they could be used similarly. In 2004, there was even a deck featuring Ninjas from Dragon and multiple copies of Claw Fossil, Root Fossil, and Mysterious Fossil. Ninjas Quick Touch Attack allowed to deal 30 damage and switch itself with the bench Pokemon, meaning your opponent would have to go through up to 12 fossils before being able to take any prize cards. Maybe this was the reason why fossils eventually start to give up prizes, and we only rarely get to see these kinds of effects again. One of the core aspects to properly play the Pokemon TCG is being able to access your cards when you need them. Luxury Ball allowed you to search your deck for any Pokemon, but had one very special restriction that we haven't seen ever since. This card could only be played if you didn't already have a copy of Luxury Ball in your discard pile, meaning that it didn't exactly prevent you from playing more than one of your deck, but made sure you couldn't just use multiple copies in this same game. Energy cards are usually played in a high amount, but when it comes to Pokemon, it can sometimes be hard to find the one you need, as you're only ever allowed to play four cards of the same name. This is where search cards come in that allow you to pick up exactly the card from your deck that you need. This goes as far back as Pokeball from Jungle that allowed you to search your deck for any Pokemon, but required a coin flip to land in your favor. Most of the time, these search cards continued to be printed as different kinds of balls from the video game, but they all shared one trait. All of them had some kind of limitation printed on them, whether it was how they could be played, like Ultra Ball, that required you to discard two cards in order to be played, a limitation of what you could find, such as Level Ball, which only lets you choose a Pokemon with 90 or less HP, or both, like Quick Ball, which was only able to pick a basic Pokemon, but also required you to discard a card in order to be played. 
Even the best card among them had its limitation, but was still powerful enough to make it onto this list. When the card was printed, recovering resources was not something that was part of the game. But it didn't stop most decks from running at least a copy of Luxury Ball to pick up some Pokemon. Years later, Luxury Ball was replaced as the most generically usable item searcher when Master Ball got an Ace spec printed in Plasma Blast. It could pick up any Pokemon from your deck and had no restrictions, but we'll take a look at Ace specs in a future video, which is why they won't be featured on this list. And at number 8, we have Reset Stamp. This card shuffled away your opponent's hand and had them draw cards equal to the remaining prize cards. Something that has always been a powerful tool in the Pokemon TCG is Disruption. Its most basic form is being able to deal with your opponent's hand and making sure they won't be able to use it properly afterwards. Usually this comes in the form of supporter cards, but when Reset Stamp was introduced as an item card, it immediately became an automatic inclusion in a lot of decks. Being an item card meant that this card could be paired with many powerful supporters that could either disrupt your opponent even further, or give you access to new cards or other ways to abuse them. Arguably, the strongest combination of cards with Recent Stamp were Jesse and James from Hidden Fates that would force your opponent to discard two cards, meaning you can get them to zero cards in hand if you use Recent Stamp on them when they only had two prize cards remaining. This could be taken even further paired with Weezing from the same set that, upon being discarded by the effect of Jesse and James, would discard an additional card from your opponent's hand with its Surrender Now ability, making the disruption combination possible one prize card earlier. Mars worked similarly, but only discarded one card from your opponent, but in return drew two cards for its user. Either or both of these supporter cards could even be paired with Lieutenant Search's strategy, which allowed you to use two additional supporters if behind on prize cards. This would technically allow you to get your opponent down to zero cards in hand while in five prizes if you could manage to get the correct combination of cards. Another interesting way to use Recent Stamp was its interaction with Naganadel GX with its Stinger GX attack that would put both players on three prize cards, meaning you could use Reset Stamp when your opponent only had one prize card remaining and afterwards force them into having to take two additional ones. This combination was even used in the final game of the 2020 Oceania International Championships to clutch out a game that seemed lost. Even without any of these combinations, this card was incredibly powerful. But its ability to be paired with heavy disruption cards eventually led to its ban in the expanded format. And in 7th place, we have Computer Search, an item card that allows you to discard two cards from your hand to search your deck for any card and put it into your hand. It was actually among the first couple of release item cards all the way back in the base set. This is a card that would have seen play in whichever kind of era of the Pokemon DCG, because Universal Search is one of the best effects any card can have. I mean, who doesn't like grabbing exactly the card you need in the situation you needed it? We even saw a glimpse of this card's power when it was released as an A spec with the exact same effect, but now only being able to use once in a deck due to how A specs rules that allowed you to only play one of them in your deck total. It still became an immense inclusion in almost every deck, and even nowadays, Computer Search is usually the A spec of choice in most expanded decks. It's hard to pinpoint a key strategy this card has been part of, as it was so universally usable, but the fact that it isn't in the upper of this list should give you a good idea of how powerful the cards still to come are. And at number 6, we have Versus Seeker. This card allows you to pick up a supporter card from your discard pile and put it into your hand, making it possible to easily use more than 4 copies of a card. While most modern era players will agree that this card is incredibly powerful, it took some time and also some good supporters for people to appreciate it. Its first ever printing was in Fire Red and Leaf Green all the way back in 2004. Back then, most players were actually content with the amount of copies their supporters gave them, and often even chose not to run the full amount of four copies for those that they didn't seem very necessary. Only occasionally did some copies of Versus Seeker make it into decks. And especially when Holon Transceiver was released, people completely opted out of it. Holon Transceiver was the core aspect of the Holon engine, a large variety of Pokemon, trainer, and energy cards that could interact with each other to gain access to powerful combos. Holon Transceiver started the combo by being able to fetch a Holon supporter card from your deck. But that wasn't everything. In addition to being able to grab supporters from the deck, it could also grab it from the discard instead, giving you a second use for a previously played supporter. Even with the Holon engine around, some players still realized how powerful Versus Seeker was and decided to run a copy in their decks, mostly to get secondary uses out of non-Holon supporter cards that were still played. A few years passed until Versus Seeker eventually got its first reprint in the 2009 set Supreme Victors. Some would say that this printing came at an unfortunate time for the play rate of Versus Seeker, because most supporters during the time were simply used for setting up your Pokemon in order to use their Poke powers or bodies to supply you with further resources or other ways to allow you to continue the game. Only rarely did players run out of the supporters and wish for additional uses for them. Some decks still found ways to include one or two copies for new situations that would require additional uses of one-off supporters, or simply to have more ways to redraw your consistency supporters after the first use, basically keeping an additional copy in the deck. Its third printing was finally when players realized how powerful a card like Versus Seeker was, and the time of its release also allowed for many uses. Another five years later in 2014, Phantom Forces brought back Versus Seeker. There were multiple reasons why it immediately had success upon its third release. The first and most important reason was the way that the game had changed in the years prior. Most decks had started to play the same three supporter cards as their core lineup. 
Professor's Research allowed a player to discard their hand and draw seven new cards, making it a powerful consistency card. Inn worked both as a draw and disruption supporter by shuffling both players' hands into the deck and drawing cards equal to their main prize cards. Lastly, Lysandra allowed both players to switch one of their opponent's bench Pokemon with their active one. Usually, all of them were played at four copies each, meaning that Versus Seeker could give you additional access to any of them, which became especially useful when considering opposing ends that could leave you with low hand sizes. Versus Seeker simply made it more likely to draw any of the good supporters. The second reason why Versus Seeker became so good was a card that was also printed in Phantom Forces. Battle Compressor is widely considered one of the best item cards ever printed, and only barely missed a spot on this list. It simply allowed you to discard up to three cards from your deck. This might not immediately seem useful, but decks that heavily worked with discard piles could make great use of it. It also allowed players to play a lot of one-off supporters to use with Versus Seeker. Battle Compressor could either directly be used to put them into your discard pile, as it was much easier to gain access to one of your four Versus Seekers in order to use any of those cards, or to get rid of the ones that you wouldn't need against a specific deck. This card's third use was deck building improvements. Even without Battle Compressor, Versus Seeker made it much easier to fit tech cards into your deck that would mainly be used in specific matchups, and therefore it didn't warrant more than one or two copies. This gave players a lot more deck building creativity and made it possible for some decks to completely flip multiple matchups around. While still being legal for play, Versus Seeker got a secret rare printed in Roaring Skies, meaning it would take even longer for it to rotate. During the entirety of its third life cycle, it was a staple inclusion in every deck. And I have no doubt that if we were to see a comeback anytime soon, we would see more decks run four copies of it again. And at number 5, we have Item Finder. This card allows you to discard two cards and pick up any trainer card from your discard pile. With half of our list being done, it's time to get into the area of cards that under no circumstance will ever come back in the form that they're listed here, because they're simply too broken. Just like Computer Search before, this card's release goes all the way back to the base set. Even back then, Item Finder was a core card in any deck and played the maximum capacity of 4 copies, showing that recovering trainer cards has always been an insanely strong concept in the Pokemon TCG. More than 10 years later in Heart Gold and Soul Silver Triumphant, this card got a worthy successor in Junk Arm. Junk Arm also had a cost to discard two cards and allowed you to take back two trainer cards. Now, you might think that this is the exact same text as Item Finder and should work the same. Under normal circumstances, this would be correct, but because of the rules and terms and wordings and attribution for trainer cards have changed, so did Junk Arm's use. With the introduction of supporter cards, any card that would strictly be applied to trainer cards would only work in what we know as items, which is one of the main reasons why it was completely overhauled in black and white. Up until that change, the three classes were called supporters, stadiums, and trainers until they were all grouped up as trainers with the subcategories supporters, stadiums, and items. With Junk Arm's use, this meant it could only grab item cards and not stadiums or supporters. This didn't stop it from being included in some decks in the beginning to recycle some of the better item cards. Just like Versus Seeker before, it took players some time to realize truly how powerful this kind of effect was, but nowhere near as long as it did for Versus Seeker. Shortly after the release of Black and White, most of the decks we see running 3 or 4 copies of Junk Arm as the meta became much more item heavy, proving just how strong item finder still was, even in a nerfed version. Towards the end of Black and White Block and Plasma Storm, this card also received an A-Spec reprint in Dowsing Machine, bringing back the original effect of recovering any kind of trainer card. Dowsing Machine has seen a lot of play since it was brought back, but it's very unlikely we'll ever see an item card like Item Finder as a regular printing ever again. And at number 4, we have Scoop Up, a card from the base set that's actually very similar to a card that's illegal for play nowadays. Just like the name suggests, Scoop Up allows you to scoop up one of your Pokemon in play and put it into your hand. One thing that's very interesting about its wording is that it specifies you get to pick up its basic stage, meaning you wouldn't only have to discard any cards attached to it like tools and energies, but should it be evolved, you would also have to get rid of the higher stages. This might not seem like a lot, especially when putting it up to Scoop Up Net, which was printed in 2019, and just picks up all previous stages as well, without being able to pick up a GX or V Pokemon. To put into perspective how good Scoop Up actually is, we need to put in historic and current context separately. When it was first released, most of the decks were heavily reliant on basic Pokemon as their main attackers, allowing for Scoop Up to be an option to fully heal Pokemon that was close to being knocked out. The best use for Scoop Up was being paired with Alakazam from the base set. Its damage swap Poke Power allows you to move damage counters on your side of the field to a Pokemon of your choice. This was used to move all the damage from your attacker to high HP Pokemon like Chansey until you could eventually pick it up with Scoop Up to mitigate multiple attacks from your opponent. While this historic use of Scoop Up already shows its potential, we need to move a little bit further ahead in time to fully showcase how powerful these kinds of effects are. Not too long after Scoop Up's release, the Pokemon TCG introduced its successor in Neo Genesis. Super Scoop Up made it possible to pick up a Pokemon, all of its evolution stages, and cards attached to it by flipping a coin correctly. This card became a mainstay in the Pokemon TCG, and up until Sword and Shield, where Scoop Up Net became its replacement, has seen frequent reprints. While Super Scoop Up has always seen some niche play, it was often considered too inconsistent due to its coin flip factor. 
which is why it has never fully become a staple. That, however, doesn't mean that picking up cards hasn't been. Supporters like AZ, that would allow you to pick up one of your Pokemon and discard all cards attached to it, have always seen some use to either heal your Pokemon, just like Scoop Up did, or to reuse abilities, which gets me to the next part. Something that has slowly creeped its way into the Pokemon TCG is support Pokemon with powerful abilities that can be used once while they're being put into your bench. Cards like Lapras from Legend Maker with its support navigation Poke power that allows you to search your deck for a supporter card and put it into your hand. Hooksy from Legends Awaken with its setup Poke power that drew cards until the player had 7 cards in hand, and many others in the last to close 20 years have been stable additions to most decks. A lot of these supporter cards were played alongside Super Scoop Up to simply reuse their affected deck through their deck further. Scoop Up Net gave us a glimpse into what would happen if an item card like Scoop Up was legal today, being an important part of many ability-based decks ever since its release. Without its limitation of not being able to be used on GX and V Pokemon, every single deck would play four copies of it to reuse cards like Genesect V and its Fusion Strike system ability to draw more cards. Pick up cards like Lumineon V and its Luminous Sign ability to search a supporter card and immediately put Lumineon itself back into your hand to prevent your opponent from knocking it out or so many others that were purposely printed on V-cards so that you wouldn't be able to abuse cards like Scoop Up Net. And this doesn't even touch on the fact that you'd be able to pick up some of the 230 HP or more V-Pokemon to heal them up. A card that can pick up any Pokemon would simply be way too strong, but we could see them back occasionally with restrictions or coin flips. And at number 3, we have Gust of Wind. This card allows you to simply switch one of your opponent's bench Pokemon with their active one. Gust of Wind has been such an iconic part of the history of the Pokemon TCG that any card that allows one player to select an opponent's Pokemon to become active is referred to as a gusting effect. There have been many trainer cards with gusting effects, such as POW, a hand extension, that have had similar effects but only worked if you were behind on prize cards, but had a second optional effect in switching an energy card instead. Throughout the entirety of Diamond and Pearl, gusting effects were completely absent from the game making it much harder to bypass active Pokemon that you didn't want to deal with. The Heart Gold and Soul Silver era brought two effects similar to Gust of Wind. Pokemon Reversal worked just like Gust of Wind, as long as you were able to call the coin flip correctly. Pokemon Circulator was a guaranteed effect, but your opponent got to choose which Pokemon would be switched in. While these two cards might not seem significantly worse than Gust of Wind, which they were, Pokemon Reversal was a key card in the 2011 World Championship. Almost every deck played four copies of it, as correctly called flips could make or break the game depending on which side of the table you were sitting at. In addition to Pokemon Reversal, a card that was previously talked about, Junk Arm, was also played in each deck, allowing for up to 8 coin flips during a game. This deck building philosophy caused many games to be purely decided by which player would be luckier with their coin flips. This, among other reasons, is why many players consider the 20 level World Championship to be one of the worst Pokemon TCG formats in history. While players were already not enjoying having to play with Pokemon Reversal in the format, things would get much worse shortly after. In August of 2011, shortly after the Notorious 2011 World, a new set was released, Emerging Powers. While bringing a lot of unplayable cards and being considered one of the weakest sets in the entire black and white block, Emerging Powers has brought one very significant card back to the TCG. Pokemon Catcher was an almost identical reprint to Gust of Wind, with everything besides the name being the same. As you might have expected based on how influential Pokemon Reversal was at the time, this card became an immediate four of of any deck that didn't use an item lock strategy. Item lock strategies, of course, were basically as the name says, strategies that prevent your opponent from using their items, which the format and decks were chock full of. The whole format was warped around Pokemon Catcher, and frustration amongst players was at an all-time high. Many decks became unplayable, and lots of games were decided by whoever found their Pokemon Catchers faster. Eventually, Pokemon realized their mistake and eroded Pokemon Catcher to just be like Pokemon Reversal and required a coin flip to be used. This has been the only errata in the entirety of the Pokemon TCG that wasn't based on a mistranslation, but actually changed how a card worked fundamentally. Pokemon Catcher has been reprinted multiple times afterwards, but they've always kept the coin flip. Especially in recent history, most unconditional gusting effects have been printed on supporter cards instead, as this is probably how it will stay, considering how game-breaking they've been in the past. Gust of Wind will forever be an iconic card, and rightfully gets put at third place. Talking about cards that we still have in the game that now require a coin flip, we've got Energy Removal from the base set in second place. Just like Scoop Up in Gust of Wind, this card immediately tells you what's up with its name. Energy Removal lets you discard one energy attached to one of your opponent's Pokemon. Considering that under normal circumstances, players can only attach one energy from their hand to any of their Pokemon, it's not difficult to understand why an effect like this is incredibly powerful. Setting back your opponent an entire turn can give an insane tempo advantage to the player using the removal card. As you might suspect, this card was also played at the full 4 copies per deck during the time, and especially in combination with Item Finder, most games ended up being a war of attrition. If you thought it couldn't get any worse, I've got bad news for you. Super Energy Removal was released at the same time, and made you discard one energy from any of your Pokemon to discard up to two energies attached to one of your opponents. Comboing these three cards meant that decks could include up to 12 energy removal options. 
Just like some of the other cards in this list that we've seen come back later, Energy Removal also got a coin flip limit put on it. The first printing of Energy Removal 2 came in Expedition and was reprinted multiple times until its last one in Power Keepers. After removal of that kind had been around for almost 10 years, Diamond and Pearl also gave the concept a break, up until a certain set that we've already talked about was released in black and white. Just like Gust of Wind was brought back in Emerging Powers under the name Pokemon Catcher, Energy Removal 2 was brought back as Crushing Hammer. This meant that Pokemon at least realized that regular Energy Removal was still too powerful without a flip. Crushing Hammer is actually still around today, but has never been a meta-defining card. Which doesn't mean it wasn't played at all. As long as it's been around, it's seen play in some decks and still sees play in some slower control-oriented strategies today. Without the coin flip, there's no doubt that every deck would play it in 4 copies, just like back in the base set. And our first place in this list is the most broken item card to ever be released in Professor Oak from the base set. Our sixth base set card in this list, by the way. At the cost of discarding your hand, this card allows you to draw a fresh hand of 7 cards. This also worked if Professor Oak was the last card remaining in your hand, which meant you could play down all your other cards and then draw 7 new ones. For players that have played anywhere between 2010 and 2022, this kind of effect might seem very familiar. Professor Juniper from Black and White, and Professor Sycamore from X and Y, and Professor's Research from Sword and Shield, all allow you to discard your hand and then draw 7 new cards. The difference is, all of those cards are supporters, which means you could only play one of them during your turn, and would even have to choose between them and other supporters with different effects. This didn't stop any of them from being played, as their effect is incredibly strong even while only being able to use once per turn. If you told any other card game player that there was a card that lets you discard your hand and then draw 7 once per turn, they would call for an immediate ban. So now imagine you had access to up to 4 copies of them for a turn. If you were to play all 4 Professor Oaks in your turn, you could draw 28 new cards, which is almost your entire deck. As ridiculous as this might sound, this was easily achievable during its original release. It's hard to put into words how insanely strong an item card that draws 7 new cards is, which is why Professor Oak deserves to first spawn this list, with no other cards even coming close. The unique thing about Pokemon SP is that all of them are basic Pokemon that can immediately be put into play. This has been repeated a lot ever since, with Pokemon EX in Black and White and Pokemon V in Sword and Shield, but SP was the first to do it. In addition to that, a lot of the SP-specific support cards were printed to make this one of the most successful archetypes when it comes to competitive play. So in this video, we'll be looking at the best of that bunch. And at number 10, we have Bronzong G. This card was one of the key aspects that helped SP to become a powerful toolbox-style deck that could make use of a large variety of attackers, while being able to easily pivot between them to always be able to provide the correct responses to the given situation. How did it do that exactly? Bronzong G has a pokey power called Galactic Switch that allows the player to move an energy card attached to whatever Pokemon SP to another Pokemon for the small price of two damage counters that would be placed on Bronzong G, which didn't really matter with cards like Pokey Turn and Bronzong G's bulky HP. Bronzong was part of the first batch of SP cards that featured a large number of Pokemon and trainers that remain core aspects of an archetype that would use these cards. This card isn't higher on the list because most people won't immediately associate Bronzong G with being influential or iconic for the format that it had been part of, but it can be said that it deserves an inclusion in many decks and was a key part of SP's success. And at number 9, we have Ambipom G, which might not be a card that many associate with being powerful, but back in the day it had many uses and could even win games by itself. Its main use was the use of Snap Attack, which allowed you to quickly deal significant damage to Pokemon without any energy attached to them. Ambipom G was used to move an energy on the defending active Pokemon to another Pokemon on your opponent's board with its Tail Coat Attack that helped fuel the condition for Snap Attack as well. This was mainly useful to pick up easy KOs on frequently used support Pokemon like Azleph, Uxie, Mesprit, and Claydol, and many others because they had low HP you could use Crobat G for massive extra damage, which we'll talk about a bit later on. Picking up these unevolved basic Pokemon was crucial to disrupt your opponent's setup. The way that the TCG rules worked back in the day even allowed you to knock out your opponent's Pokemon before they even got to draw a card, as you were allowed to attack on your first turn, even when going first. One of the most prominent uses and a key part in later SP mirror matches was Ambipom G's ability to knock out opposing Garchomp C level X, that used Dragon Rush by attaching an energy gain and a double colorless energy, which they would have to discard after, leaving Garchomp C with zero energies and a 2x weakness to Ambipom G's snap attack. And at number 8 we have Dragonite FB. A card that at first was very underrated compared to most of the other SP Pokemon that made this list. Being able to hit for 80 against other SP Pokemon with its attack Mach Blow meant it could take out almost every regular SP basic that was played, and with some help from Crobat G, none of them were out of range. Being a colorless type was both a blessing and a curse at the same time, as it could take out Garchomp C level X, but in return would also be dealt with by Garchomp C's Earthquake due to the colorless weakness that it brought with it. Giant Tail was only really used in desperate situations, but could still offer a viable option to close out games if everything else would fail. While every other entry on this list immediately got included in Archetype, it took some time for Dragonite FB to become an established part of SP strategies, but once it did, it was a major threat. 
even being a contributor to a World Championship win in 2010. Because of how late Dragonite FB's potential in the mirror was discovered, this card doesn't rank as high in this list despite its clear use in the mirror match. And at number 7, we have a bit of a controversial one, as Palkia G and Palkia G level X aren't immediately what comes to mind when people think about dominant cards in the SP format, mainly because during most of the SP formats, they were already way past their prime. But when you consider its domination during the first year after its release, your mind will most likely change. Even if Palkia G wasn't as prevalent anymore towards the end of SP. When the first SP cards were released in Platinum, Dialga G and Palkia G were the flagship attackers of the archetype, and they started dominating events from the get-go. Palkia G's level X main use was its Poke Power Lost Cyclone, which forced both players to put Pokemon into the Lost Zone until they would each have three bench Pokemon remaining. Once a card hits the Lost Zone, it's removed from play and can't be used for the remainder of the game. This was a useful tool to limit your opponent's options in play, or get rid of your own cards that you didn't have any use for anymore. Using this in combination with his attack Hydro Shot meant that you can get your opponent to just two bench Pokemon in one turn, crippling their setup. Palkia G's Pearl Breath helped to set up damage on your opponent's bench for easier knockouts at later points in the game. Unfortunately for Palkia G, the next set already brought a more powerful attacker in Luxray GL Level X. Infernape 4 Level X was the second big attacker for Rising Rival, but was easily checked by Palkia G. Palkia G Level X still found some success during the 2009 World format, with its highest placement being a top 8 in the 2017 World Championship, outperforming Luxray GL and Infernape 4 deck. Luxray GL might have been an issue for Palkia G, but it also acted as a valuable ally as the combination of these two was able to be placed in the top 16 of the 2009 World Championships multiple times. Palkia G remained relevant until the release of Supreme Victors in late 2009, where the most known and most powerful version of the SP archetype finally came together. And at number 6, we have another utility card. Lucario GL's Pokebody, Boundary Aura, changed the weaknesses of all Pokemon in play to times 2 something that has become the normal Pokemon TCG ever since Heart Gold and Soul Silver, but at the time was exclusive to SP Pokemon. This was meant to balance them in comparison to regular Pokemon. Lucario GL, however, helped to mitigate the weakness by forcing it onto your opponent, which became especially successful considering the number of different types that the archetype could use to attack with. This card made dealing with a lot of top matchups at the time much easier because it transformed the negligible plus 30 weakness into a much more manageable and relevant times 2. Lucario GL became a staple in almost all SP decks because of how relevant gaining an advantage was in this format where every game was razor thin. And at number 5, we have Blaziken FB. This card was a hard-hitting powerhouse that also provided some utility when used correctly. Blaziken's most used attack was Luring Flame, which would switch the defending Pokemon with one of your opponent's bench and leave it burn. Burn at the time was a permanent status condition that could only be removed by leaving the active spot. In between turns, the players whose Pokemon is afflicted by Burn would flip a coin, and if Tails, they would take 20 damage. If Heads, nothing. Luring Flame was a valuable attack against bench sitters like Claydol and Vileplume that could be pulled to either be knocked out, or, depending on the amount of retreat and switch options your opponent had, to stick something in the active spot while using Garchomp C level X's Dragon Rush attack to do 80 damage over and over, clean up your opponent's bench Pokemon while they're left helpless in the active spot. Blaziken FB level X's attack Jet Shoot was also very capable of providing cleanup duty by itself, being able to deal 80 damage for just 2 energies. One, if you were factoring in energy gain. Its Pokebody Burning Spirit, which added an extra 40 damage to Pokemon afflicted by the burn condition, could even help to take out high HP threats. The strategy was as follows. Pull them up with Luring Flame, leave them burned, and attack them on the following turn. All of these things made Blaziken both a very good attacker, but also a valuable tech for SP decks. And at number 4, we have Dialga G. Dialga G and Dialga G Level X have stood the test of time. Dialga G was there at the very beginning of the earliest SP builds primarily as a tool to slow down your opponent by not allowing them to play any items or stadiums with the deafen attack, and eventually finished them with Dialga G's second strike. Eventually it became an important ally against Vileplume by blocking its allergy flower Pokebody that would prevent both players from playing any item cards from their hand. With Dialga G Level X's own Pokebody, Time Crystal, towards the end of its lifetime. Compared to most other cards on this list, or even SP cards in general, Dialga G was a much slower card and more oriented towards making your opponent's life hard by being hard to knock out itself. Late game Dialga G deck's boards consisted of one huge Dialga with multiple special metal energies attached, reducing any damage done to it by 10 for each of them, and would use the combination of Poke Turn and Garchomp C level X's Healing Breath Poke Power to heal once it would get in range of being knocked out. While this archetype was not the most popular among SP decks, it was played by top players at the time who favored this build more than others. And at number 3, we have Garchomp C Level X, a card you've heard about many times before in this video already. This card is widely considered the best attacker of the deck, and it's not difficult to understand why. Dragon Rush allowed you to, at the cost of discarding two energy cards, deal 80 damage to one of your opponent's Pokemon. 
which during that time would immediately take care of most basic and stage 1 Pokemon, allowing you to either disrupt your opponent's setup by taking out their consistency Pokemon, or even the basics or stage 1s of the main attacker itself. And if this wasn't already enough during the release of Supreme Victors, Garchomp C received an immense buff by the release of Double Colorless Energy and Heart Gold and Soul Silver, to allow it to attack for just one Double Colorless Energy and one Energy Gain. On top of that, Garchomp C level X's Healing Breath Poke Power would create nightmares for any deck that wasn't able to take out your SP Pokemon in one hit because it would heal your board, or to simply get more uses out of your Bronzong G after it had already accumulated a lot of damage counters on it. These numerous uses, as well as Garchomp C level X's colorless typing and free retreat, made this the most threatening and versatile attacker in the entire SP engine. And at number 2, we have Crobat G. Players that have played the Pokemon TCG in the last two years know how good Zigzagoon's headbutt tantrum from Sword and Shield is, in combination with Scubub Net and Crobat G fulfills the same purpose, helping you pick up knockouts by placing extra damage counters with its Flashbite Poke Power. Flashbite would place one damage counter on your opponent's side of the board in any way you like when Crobat G enters play. This ability, paired with Poke Turn, would allow players to use Crobat G multiple times in one game to set up perfect numbers where they could. Flashbite was one of the best Poke Powers during the 2009 until 2011 formats, helping players hit the correct amount of damage to take important KOs in some matchups. This went so far that even decks that had nothing to do with SP would splash in a couple of Cyrus's Conspiracy, Poke Turns, and Crobat G simply to get the extra damage advantage. In SP decks, Crobat G would also get some additional use in being able to use his attack against tanky threats like Donphan Prime that the deck would otherwise struggle with. Fitting the correct energy wasn't even an issue, as most SP decks already played Psychic Energies for promo Toxic Crow G, which was a popular counter against Luxray GL level X. Now, Gusting has been a major part of the last 10 plus years in the Pokemon TCG, but before we had cards like Boss's Orders, Cross Switcher, Pokemon Catcher, Lycanroc GX, or even Umbreon VMAX, there was Luxray GL level X. With that being said, in first place we have not only the best SP card, but also one of the best cards during its time. Maybe even all time. Luxray GL level X. This card's bright look allows you to, upon evolving your Luxray GL, switch one of your opponent's Pokemon with their active Pokemon. This, in combination with Poke Turn, multiple Lux Rays, and Aaron's Collection, would theoretically allow you to take each of your prize cards by pulling up some low HP basic Pokemon to then knock it out with Flash Impact or Trash Bolt. But you didn't even have to use Luxray GL itself to take out these Pokemon, or even any SP Pokemon for that matter, which is why Luxray GL Level X found its way into many decks outside the SP archetype. Much like Crobat G, players would use more than 10 slots in their deck just to fit their package of Cyrus Conspiracy, Poke Turn, Luxray GL, Luxray GL Level X, and SP Radar just to get access to the ability of bringing up whatever Pokemon you wanted on any given turn. This strategy was mainly used by a deck that would sometimes struggle with dealing enough damage to take out a deck's main attacker. So, Luxray GL Level X was the perfect addition to close out games. Some of the most popular users are Jump Pluff from the Heart Gold and Soul Silver base set and Gyarados from the Stormfront expansion. Luxray GL Level X doesn't even need a discussion to determine if it was one of the best cards in the history of the game, winning every world championship that it was legal in from 2009 to 2010, even covering both its roles as attack in the 2009 world championships winning deck, and being used as one of the main attackers in a deck that combined the power of Luxray GL Level X and Garchomp C Level X, two cards that you're probably familiar with by now, and that both received reprints of Pokemon's iconic 25th anniversary set, Celebrations, as a homage to their legacy. With all of these powerful cards in mind, and many more that help the archetype to accumulate affordable strength with fully assembled, it's no surprise that SP decks dominated the games as long as they were around. Ever since being introduced in the 2002 booster set Expedition, supporter cards have played a key role throughout the history of Pokemon's TCG. Whether it might be drawing cards, powering up your Pokemon, or disrupting your opponent, they're a key part of any deck strategy. So in this list, we'll take a look at some of the best supporter cards that have impacted the game at the time they were introduced in. And at number 10, we have Colrus's Experiment. Being released in the Sword and Shield Lost Origin expansion, this card is the backbone of the so-called Lost Zone decks, as it allows you to look at 5 cards, choose 3 of them to go directly to your hand, while you put the other 2 into the Lost Zone, removing them from play. This deck's goal is to get at least 10 cards into the Lost Zone to use Stabilize Lost Mine Attack, to place damage counters on your opponent's field to set or pick up knockouts on your opponent's Pokemon. This, however, is only where the deck hits its power ceiling, with Cramorant being able to attack for no energies with its attack spit innocently to deal 110 damage or Mirage Gate at 7 cards in the Lost Zone to power up various attackers by being able to attach two different types of energies to your Pokemon in play. In order to get to these numbers, the deck had two main goals. One side was Comfy's Flower Selecting ability, so let's look at your top two cards of your deck and put one into the Lost Zone, while the other card goes directly into your hand. And the other, Colorus's Experiment, which allows you to put two cards into the Lost Zone each time you play it, allowing you to quickly access your key pieces while removing cards you won't need any longer to fill your attacks. 
Back in the Heart Gold and Soul Silver era of the Pokemon TCG, a supporter with a similar effect called Sage Trainings existed. It, however, only allowed you to choose two cards that would have gone to your hand, and also didn't have an archetype behind it that heavily benefited from discarding three cards. And at number 9, we have a card that should have never been printed with the text that it has. Luzamine allows you to pick up two cards in any combination of Stadium and Supporter cards, allowing you to regain access to your resources at the cost of a Supporter for the turn, making it an ideal card for slower types of decks that didn't mind not using a Supporter card to draw cards for a turn in favor of giving them new access to their matchup relevant cards in the upcoming turns. This card, however, came with a huge design flaw. The fact that Luzamine was able to pick itself up from the discard pile meant that it could infinitely loop her if you had two of them in circulation. This loop in combination with a ton of disruptive stadiums and supporter cards created a bunch of decks that were considered unhealthy to the game due to their oppressive nature, and now thanks to Luzamine, infinite resources. This eventually led to it being banned in Pokemon's expanded format a secondary format that features any card from black and white onwards. It has since been unbanned, as other problematic cards have been put on there instead, limiting the damage it can cause. And at number 8, we have Marnie. This card has both players shuffle their hands and put them at the bottom of their decks, after which the user draws 5 new cards, while their opponent only gets 4. This already makes Marnie a very unique card, as every comparable card in the past has always forced players to shuffle their hand into their deck, instead of putting them at the bottom. What might seem like a small detail at first, it is a lot more significant than it seems, as a lot of decks try to build up their hand with a variety of options to use in response to their opponent's plays. Marty mitigates this strategy, forcing players to first find a way to shuffle their decks after it's been used to get the cards back into the potential draws from the top. This can cause a lot of frustration to the player that got hit by this card, but also opens up new strategic routes for either player. Pokemon like Oranguru from Sword and Shield allows a player to exchange one of their cards in the hand with the top card of their deck, with its Primate Wisdom ability. Its ability to strap your opponent in key situations, and being able to put your opponent to only 4 cards as early as the first turn that you can use a supporter, makes Marty an ever relevant threat in the game that can win games by itself, if not respected enough by your opponent. In 7th place is one of the aforementioned problematic supporter cards that Luzamine was able to recover, Lieutenant Surge's Strategy, which allowed the user to use 2 additional supporter cards after it was used. As expected, an effect that is as strong as this one comes with some kind of drawback. In this case, it's a condition that the player using this card has to have taken less prize cards than their opponent, creating its intended use of being a comeback card for the player losing the game. This, however, becomes a problem if you factor in decks in the Pokemon TCG that have no intention of winning the game by taking prizes, or at the very least plan on draining their opponent's resources by doing so. At first, this wasn't too much of a problem, and Lieutenant Search's strategy mostly fulfilled niche or gimmick uses. While some people already kept a close eye on it, just waiting for a way to heavily abuse being able to use more supporter cards during a turn. This moment came not even half a year after its release when the Unified Minds release reset stamp, shortly before the 2019 World Championships, an item card that would shuffle your opponent's hand into their deck, after which they would draw new cards equal to the number of the remaining prize cards. This in combination with the previously mentioned Mars supporter cards that lets its user draw two cards while discarding a card from their opponent's hand meant that you'd be able to remove all cards from your opponent's hand by combining Reset Stamp with Lieutenant Surge's strategy and two copies of Mars. On top of that, Chip Chip Ice Axe would allow you to look at the top three cards of your opponent's deck, pick one that would remain on top, and shuffle the rest back into the deck. This strategy became even more powerful when the Jesse and James supporter cards were released that discarded two cards in both players' hands, meaning you can get your opponent to no cards in their hand even faster. Surge in combination with these cards already caused the creation of multiple good control decks in Standard, but Expanded was an entirely different piece. As I mentioned before, Luzamine was banned until other cards took its place, and the cards we just went over are exactly these. Even today, all these cards besides Mars are still banned, among others that allowed you to regain access to them, showing how powerful they were when put together. And at number 6, we have a place occupied by the oldest card on this list. Steven's Advice allows its owner to draw cards equal to the amount of Pokemon that your opponent has in play as long as the prior hand size didn't exceed 7 cards, including this card. This card provided an incredible boost in consistency to many decks due to its immense draw power, thanks to most decks filling up the majority of their bench space. Similar cards have been printed since, but none of them have made their way into decks the same way that Steven's advice did, being a staple throughout its lifespan. The card that came closest to replicating the card's success was Erica's Hospitality from Team Up, with the difference of Erica's Hospitality could only be used if you had 4 or less cards in hand, making her slightly harder to use than Steven's advice. On top of that, Erica's Hospitality had to compete with a much larger selection of powerful draw supporters and support Pokemon. It, however, still managed to find a place in some decks as an additional draw option, showing how good Steven's advice must have been more than 10 years prior. And at number 5, there's a supporter effect that has been reprinted many times at this point, causing this spot to be shared with multiple cards at once. Professor Juniper, Professor Psychomore, and the various versions of Professor's Research featuring popular professors from the video games in the Pokemon Go, such as Magnolia, Juniper, Willow, Oak, and Rowan allowing the player to discard their entire hand and draw 7 new cards. 
Ever since the first printing of Professor Juniper in black and white, this effect has been a staple in many decks whenever these cards were around, but not without controversy. Back when it was first released, some players didn't like the direction the game was heading into, requiring players to discard their valuable resources instead of being able to hold on to them like it had been often the case before that. By now though, discarding your cards in favor of drawing through your deck has become something that players are used to, and the large variety and draw supporters that the game provides players with nowadays makes it possible to avoid it if your deck can't afford to discard too many cards, making the decks that can utilize these cards incredibly powerful. And at number 4, we have one that goes to one of, if not the most dominant archetype specific supporter. Welder allows the user to attach up to two fire energies to one of their Pokemon, after which they get to draw three cards. This, in combination with other powerful fire supporter cards at the time, allowed Welder decks to completely dominate the format to the point that three international level events featured two Welder decks, each in the grand finals. The 2019 World Championship had Blazeful on GX go against Mewtwo and Mew GX, with the latter taking the title of World Championship. The 2019 Latin American International Championships featured a Reshiram and Charizard GX decks against Mewtwo and Mew GX, with Reshiram and Charizard coming out on top. And the 2020 Oceana International Championships once again put these two decks up against each other, with Mewtwo and Mew being victorious the second time the two decks met on the international stage. All of these decks made use of a variety of different attackers that would be powered up with Welder to use powerful attacks that would normally not have been able to attack as quickly, making them the clear best decks during the time. While there have been other supporters, none of them were as popular and able to work by just playing four copies of that one supporter, something that Welder decks managed to make work. This incredible dominance earns this card a well-deserved place on this list, and only time will tell if a supporter will ever be able to match its success in the future. And at number 3 we have a card that shaped the way the game is played today, and another one, just like the Professor cards earlier, that has been reprinted into multiple different names. Boss's Orders, or Lysandra, how it's called during its first release, allows the players to pick one of their opponent's bench Pokemon and switch it with their active Pokemon, allowing for targeted knockouts. Or other purposes, like leaving up a Pokemon that won't be able to retreat or switch out as easily by the next turn. Or, in extreme cases, even win the game by deck out because there are no ways left to get it out of the active spot. Before Lysander was first printed in Furious Fist, players had to work harder to get those bench knockouts by using abilities, item, or supporter cards with heavy drawbacks. Or even dedicate their entire deck strategy to being able to just not hit the active Pokemon. This card allowed for players to simply splash it into any kind of deck, and it didn't just change the way the game was, or still is, played, but even changed deck building itself, forcing players to respect the possibility that some Pokemon might not stay on the bench for long. This game warping influence earns Lysandra and Boss's Orders a well-deserved spot on this list. And at number 2, we have another card that's been known under multiple names, and another one that changed how the game was played during their existence, much like our previous entry. Rocket's Admin and In both shuffle both players' hands into their deck, after which they would draw cards equal to their prize cards remaining, making them both a powerful draw supporter and also valuable disruption cards. Their early game use would often simply be getting a hand to refresh in order to set up your Pokemon and general strategy after which you could still use it to put your opponent to a low amount of cards in hand after they've drawn multiple prize cards. This strategy became especially effective when the player who was using these cards hadn't taken a lot of prize cards yet, making it a draw and disruption card at the same time. While they were legal for play, both of them were definite staples that made it into every deck, with only very small exceptions. Their legacy was solidified with Rocket's Admin got a unique printing in Pokemon's 25th anniversary set celebrations, and even today, these cards are usually what a lot of top players call for to be reprinted, especially when they feel like a format is getting stale or offers too little comeback options. And at number 1, we've got Lysandra's Trump Card. This card shuffles both players' discard piles back into their deck, besides other copies of Lysandra's Trump Card, in either player's discard pile. This in itself functions as a reset button for resources, and can completely flip the game around that would have normally been dedicated to either player having used up any specific card they might need to win the game. Technically, you would be able to see this kind of reset 8 times per game if both players were playing 4 copies of it. This kind of loop became a lot easier though, thanks to Versus Seeker, an item card that allows its user to pick a support card from the discard pile to put into their hand. Since Versus Seeker worked as an additional copy of Lysandra's Trump card that didn't share the name itself, players would be able to reset their discard piles as many times as they wanted, as long as they had a copy of Versus Seeker available. Since Versus Seeker by itself was already a staple card in most decks, this became a very easy feat to accomplish. While some decks simply used Lysandra's Trump card to gain additional access to resources, others played energy removal and healing cards that they would loop until they could win the game. At first, this didn't seem like much of an issue, as control types of decks aren't unhealthy to the game by nature, as they simply use different strategies to win the games. This, however, became an issue when Shaman EX was released. Its setup ability allowed the player to draw cards until they had 6 cards in their hand. Since its ability wasn't limited to being once per turn, and access to cards like Super Scoop Up that, upon flipping heads on a coin flip, allowed you to pick Shaman EX back up, 
led to a strategy where players were able to draw their entire decks turn after turn, ending it with using Lysandra's trump card to have every resource available at the beginning of the next one. This was too much for the Pokemon Company, and led to the first ban since the early 2000s, and being the first ever supporter card that this happened to. Even today it remains on the ban list in the Pokemon Expanded format, and doesn't seem possible that it will ever be allowed to come back, making it the single best supporter in the history of the Pokemon TCG. Supporter cards are powerful trainer cards that can only be used once per turn. However, just like Pokemon, not all supporter cards are up to par with the rest that are released alongside them, by either being weaker or worse versions of supporter cards that already exist, or because their interactions are too hard to pull off to be considered worth playing. And at number 10, we have Here Comes Team Rocket from X and Y Evolutions. When this card is played, both players turn the prize cards face up for the rest of the game. Today, Evolutions is mostly known for being one of the most sought after collectible booster sets after the hype for it was reignited during the lockdowns in 2020. This is largely due to the nostalgia the set brings with it by reprinting old cards like Pikachu and Charizard from the base set. Another big part of the set was the homage this was paid to older item cards, with some of these item cards being designed without supporter categories in mind as it had been introduced in the first couple of sets. They had to be changed to be supporter cards. One of these cards was Here Comes Team Rocket, which was originally released in Team Rocket as a regular trainer card. The Evolutions version, however, isn't the first supporter version of the card. In 2004, set EX Rocket Returns, the exact same card had already been released as a supporter card. Back then, this card was already not really relevant, but the Evolutions version rightfully makes it into this list due to another card that existed at the same time. Town Map from X and Y Breakthrough is an item card that flips your prize cards face up. Town Map saw a reasonable amount of plays that allowed players to better control their prize cards and can allow them potentially get match relevant cards that they could normally only get from the prize cards by luck. It was even featured in the 2018 World Championship winning deck in the Masters division. On the flip side, Here Comes Team Rocket never saw any kind of competitive play. Not only because Town Map was simply a better option by not giving your opponent the same kind of benefit as you got, but also because Town Map didn't require to use your supporter card for the turn just to be able to look at your prize cards. This combination of an already existing card that did a much better job and also not being a supporter card puts Here Comes Team Rocket on this list of the worst supporter cards of all time. And at number 9, we have Sword Ward and Shieldbird from Sword and Shield Battle Styles. When this card is played, you get to choose a trader card from your discard pile and show it to your opponent. Your opponent then gets to decide if they want to allow you to put the chosen card into your hand, or if you draw three cards. Sword Ward and Shieldbird is one of the many cards that was released through the Sword and Shield block that featured a draw three effect with additional benefits to make them more interesting and viable than the classic draw three supporters that we've gotten ever since Black and White introduced Sharon. Sharon was replaced by Tierno in X and Y, and then again got replaced by Hau in Sun and Moon. Sword and Shield brought not only Ha, but also friends in Galar, friends in Hisui, and Barry. We even have confirmation already that Pneumonia from Scarlet and Violet will have the same draw 3 cards effect as many cards before. As previously mentioned, Sword and Shield started releasing some cards with the same effect and additional benefits. Avery draws 3 cards and forces your opponent to discard Pokemon from their bench until they have 3 bench Pokemon. Bird Keeper switches your active Pokemon in addition to a card draw and Worker has the additional effect of discarding a Stadium card in play. All of these cards have seen some kind of competitive play, with Sword and Shilbert being the exception. The main reason for it not being viable is that the extra effect is not an additional one, but an alternative. Meaning that unlike all the other cards, you don't get to draw three cards, but also do something else. The next issue is that your opponent is the one that gets to choose what happens after you pick the trainer card from your discard pile. In most cases, your opponent will simply pick the choice of you drawing three cards. The only time they will let you take the trainer card is when they know that you won't get good use for it. In the worst case scenario, you would want to draw three cards, but your opponent would allow you to take a trainer card that doesn't help you at all. This combination of a card that already isn't too great on its own, and the fact that there are plenty of other supporters with better effects legal for tournament play at the same time makes Swordward and Shilbert one of the worst supporter cards of all time. And at number 8, we've got Mom's Kindness from Diamond and Pearl Majestic Dawn. This card simply draws two cards. By today's standards, a card that only draws two cards would not even be questioned about being viable, considering that many supporter cards draw at least three cards, or if they draw two, have some additional benefits or potential conditions that let them draw even more. This meant that a card that just drew 2 at the time wasn't good enough compared to later in the future when a draw 3 effect became powerful due to the lack of options available. Even in 2008 when Mom's Kindness was released, it was never more than a bulk card that no one looked at. While the modern Pokemon TCG heavily revolves around supporter cards that draw cards in various ways, like discarding cards or shuffling back into the deck, the Diamond and Pearl era in which this card's release was much more search-based and supporters that just drew cards were rarely printed and didn't see a lot of play. When Majestic Dawn got released, the game still features some cards from the EX block that lasted from EX Ruby and Sapphire in 2003 to EX Power Keepers in 2007. Commonly used supporter cards from these set were cast away from EX Crystal Guardians, which searches your deck for a supporter, Pokemon tool, or basic energy card. Celio's Network from EX Fire Red and Leaf Green, that searches your deck for any Pokemon except EX, and Steven's Advice from EX Hidden Legends. 
Steven's Advice is one of the few draw supporter cards that saw a lot of play due to its powerful effect of drawing cards equal to the number of your opponent's Pokemon in play, as long as you don't have 7 or more cards including this card in your hand when you try playing it. Supporter from the Diamond and Pearl block that saw a lot of play were Roseanne's Research from Sacred Wonders, a supporter that searches your deck for 2 cards in any combination of basic Pokemon and basic energies, and Bebe's Research from Mysterious Treasures, which has you put one card from your hand on top of your deck in exchange searches your deck for any Pokemon and puts it into your hand. With those meta-relevant cards, it's already not too hard to understand why Mom's Kindness didn't see any play. But it becomes even more obvious if you look at some of the Diamond and Pearl supporter cards that didn't even see any play but still outclass Mom's Kindness. Team Galactic's Mars from Secret Wonders also draws two cards, but in addition also puts a random card from your opponent's hand at the bottom of their deck. Another card we can look at is Professor Oak's Visit, also from Secret Wonders. This card draws three cards and then lets you choose a card from your hand and put it at the bottom of your deck. These buff cards that were even released before Mom's Kindness never saw any kind of relevant play, meaning that a nerfed version of them wouldn't see play either. The existence of cards that already have the same effect with additional benefits on top of many good supporters in general make Mom's Kindness one of the most unnecessarily printed cards. And at number 7, we have League Staff from Sword and Shield Vivid Voltage. This card draws two cards, and an additional two cards if Wide on Stadium is in play. Wide on Stadium is a stadium card that heals 100 damage from a V Pokemon that evolves into a V Max Pokemon. Drawing four cards is actually a very good effect, which is why cards that would draw four or more cards are usually put behind some kind of barrier. The most prominent, or played, example of a card like this is Coach Trainer from Sun and Moon Unified Minds. When this card is played, while you have a tag team Pokemon in your active spot, you get to draw four cards. Should the condition not be fulfilled, you only draw two cards, just like League Staff. Coach Trainer would usually be used in decks that either exclusively ran tag team Pokemon, or only a few copies of cards that weren't, making it a card that drew four most of the time. This kind of conditional draw four effect started during Sun and Moon with Samson Oak, a supporter that draws two cards and additional two of both active Pokemon are of the same type. Especially during Sun and Shield, these kinds of effects have been printed in many types with all kinds of different conditions to be fulfilled. Dan from Rebel Clash only draws the full four cards if you beat your opponent in a game of Rock, Paper, Scissors. Schoolboy and Schoolgirl only draw cards if your opponent is on an even or uneven number of prize cards. Or Eye Scan simply replaces the tag team part of Coach Trainer with Hisuian Pokemon in your active spot. One thing all these cards have in common is that they interact with types of cards in play, or don't require any specific cards to be in play. The problem with League Staff is that, in order to draw 4 cards, it requires one specific card in play. Which means that you can never have more than 4 copies of in your deck, whereas cards like Hisu and Pokemon or Tag Team Pokemon could be played in larger quantities. Or if you didn't play any cards of other subcategories, would always be guaranteed to be in play. This problem becomes even more apparent when considering that out of the 10 plus cards with conditional draw 4 effects, only Coach Trainer and Schoolgirl ever saw any amount of significant play, as they are the only 2 cards that could be turned into permanent draw 4 cards. As previously mentioned, Coach Trainer could be used in decks that only ran Tag Team Pokemon, as they weren't forced to run any kind of supporter Pokemon. Schoolgirl would simply be used in decks that only ran Pokemon that give up two prize cards, guaranteeing that you would almost always be on an even number of prize cards. This alone makes the League staff borderline unplayable. What makes the card even worse is the fact that the card that was needed to fulfill its condition wasn't used in any kind of deck. White on Stadium never saw any kind of play, so forcing a deck to run four copies of a card that wasn't good just to potentially enable a draw 4 supporter just wasn't worth it at all. And at number 6, we have Misty's Water Command from Sun and Moon Hidden Fates. This card allows you to move any number of water energies attached to your Pokemon in play to any of your Psyduck, Horsey, Staryu, Starby GX, Magikarp, Gyarados, or Lapras. To indicate how bad this card is, we first need to break down how its effect is designed and what it could alternatively look like. The best possible design for a supporter card would simply be one that lets you move any kind of energy of your Pokemon to a different one of your Pokemon. After that, you could restrict which type of energies a card like this could move. This could either specify basic or special energies, but it could also already limit it down to a specific type of basic energy. After that, you would get something like Misty's Water Command, a card that restricts what kind of energy you can move, and also what choice of Pokemon you're even able to move the energies to. Designing utility-based supporter cards can often be hard, as cards that are too generic can often cause unwanted strategies to merge because they weren't properly thought about when the card was designed. When it comes to moving energies, however, the maximum utility that can be gained from the effect is limited as you would require an incredibly strong LA Acceleration card that could cause unfair interactions. For a card as restrictive as Misty's Water Command, you would expect some of the cards that could make use of it to be playable to actually make it worth playing. This, however, wasn't the case at all. Most of the Pokemon that could make use of it weren't particularly useful, and the only one of them that saw any kind of competitive play was Starmie GX. This Stage 1 GX Pokemon from the same set as Misty's Water Command comes with three attacks. Its first attack, Star Stream, it deals 40 damage for one water energy and attaches two water energies from discard pile to one of your Pokemon. 
Spinning attack requires 3 colorless energy and deals 100 damage. Its GX attack, Hydro Pump GX, deals 40 base damage and additional 40 damage for each water energy attached to this Pokemon. The deck that made use of Starmie GX featured Butu and Butte GX from Sun and Moon Unified Minds. I said that was released a couple of months after Hidden Fates. With its Perfection ability, which lets you use any attacks of GX and EX Pokemon on your bench or your discard pile, as long as you have the correct energies attached to it. It was primarily used to copy Starmie's Star Stream attack to get extra energies into play as quickly as turn 1. Mewtwo and Mew copying the attack from Starmie GX in the discard pile, however, also meant there wasn't even a Starmie GX in play that could have made use of Misty's Water Command, as Perfection didn't require you to play Star Use that you could evolve. The next time the Water Pokemon became relevant was when Sword and Shield was released and brought Froth's Moth with it. Its Ice Stance ability allows you to attach water energies from your hand to any of your bench water Pokemon as often as you like during your turn. Frostmoth already being able to attach energies to your Pokemon that you want them on meant there was absolutely no need to run a supporter card like Misty's Water Command, especially since none of these decks that made use of Frostmoth's ability even featured Pokemon that could receive energies from Misty's Water Command. The only way to make use of it in these decks would be to force you to play Pokemon you didn't want to, just to use a supporter card with a subpar effect. With none of these water decks ever even being close to consider playing it, it should come as no surprise that Misty's Water Command makes it onto this list of the worst supporters of all time. And at number 5, we have Cedric Juniper from Black and White Legendary Treasures. This card has you put a Pokemon from your hand face down and tell your opponent which Pokemon it is. Your opponent then has to guess the height of that Pokemon, and should they guess correctly, they would draw 3 cards. Otherwise, you got to draw 3 instead. Drawing 3 cards wasn't horrible at the time this card was released, but it came with a couple of issues that caused it to be arguably one of the worst supporters at the time. Firstly, drawing 3 cards was not an amazing payoff if you got your opponent to guess the wrong height. Many decks already played powerful draw cards like Professor Juniper that discarded your hand in order to draw 7 cards, or in which shuffled both players' hands into their deck to draw cards equal to the remaining prize cards, a card that could be used for both early game consistency or late game disruption due to its versatile nature. Decks that didn't particularly like to discard their hand could even opt to play Bianca, a supporter that draws cards until you have 6 cards in your hand, which would often draw even more cards than Cedric Juniper. The biggest issue for this card, however, and the main reason why it was almost always a mistake to consider it for your deck, is Sharon. Sharon simply drew 3 cards and was legal for tournament play during the entire time that Cedric Juniper was. This meant that even decks that wanted to build big hands and wanted a supporter card that drew 3 cards had a much better option than Cedric Juniper, as you never had to have the risk of your opponent getting to draw cards instead. And this gets us exactly to the next issue that this card had. Having to tell your opponent which Pokemon they had to guess the height of could sometimes mean they had an easy time of doing it. An argument that was used as early as this card's reveal was that players could simply memorize the heights of meta-relevant cards in order to always correctly guess the height of these Pokemon. While this could be solved by Cedric Juniper decks using more obscure Pokemon in the strategy, expecting people to actually study heights of Pokemon seemed like a stretch regardless. A much more realistic approach of people being able to correctly guess the height is information that was available to players during a game. If you or your opponent already had a copy of the cards in play, the discard pile, or one that was in your hand, you could simply read off the height and always correctly guess the height. All of these issues combined, in addition to a card already existing that provided the same effect, while already not being meta-relevant itself, makes Cedric Juniper one of the most unnecessary and useless supporter cards ever printed. And at number 4, we have Brock's Training from Sun and Moon Hidden Fates. This card allows you to attach an energy card from your hand to one of your Geodude, Graveler, Golem, Onyx GX, Cubone, Rhyhorn, Rhydon, or Sudowoodo. Much like Misty's Water Command, a card that we've talked about earlier, Brock's Training is too restrictive for the little payoff that it provides. Only a couple of sets after this card's release, the Sword and Shield expansion brought Bede, a supporter that attaches a basic energy card from your hand to one of your bench Pokemon. The only benefits that Brock's Trainer has over Bede are that Bede can't attach to your active Pokemon, and that it only attaches basic energy cards. When considering how useless all the Pokemon featured on Brock's Training are, this is not too much of a disadvantage. What makes this even worse is the fact that Bede never saw any kind of play because attaching an energy card with your supporter for your turn was simply too bad. Much like Misty's Water Command from the same set, Brock's training combined an already subpar effect with restrictions that forced you to use Pokemon that were completely unviable. Unlike Misty's Water Command, none of the Pokemon featured on Brock's training ever saw any kind of play, and therefore it makes this card even worse and gets a rightful place on our list. And at number 3, we have Erika from the 2019 set Sun and Moon Cosmic Eclipse. When this card is played, both players get to draw up to 3 cards, with the player playing the card down having to draw first. Erika is in a really weird spot when it comes to its release, because when taking a look at other cards that are released in Cosmic Eclipse, Erika seems out of place. Most other support cards that were released in the same set featured characters from Sun and Moon games. The ones that didn't feature characters that were particularly relevant in those games, or didn't appear in them at all, were cards with entirely new effects which is where the second part of Erika's weirdness comes in. All the way back in Gym Heroes in 2000, an item card featuring the same character from Red and Blue video games was released. 
This item, or back then just trainer card, had the same effect of drawing up to three cards, followed by your opponent drawing up to three as well. Normally these kinds of pseudo reprints to pay homage to nostalgic cards are printed in special sets like X and Y Evolutions or Celebrations, or at the very least come in a set that has a similar concept for multiple cards, most often because they were leftover cards from a Japanese mini or promotional set that didn't get in the West, and therefore these cards are put in our regular sets. This doesn't seem to be the case for Erika, as it's the only kind of that card in Cosmic Eclipse, making her feel very out of place already. When it comes to playability, Erika wasn't even too far off the power level of many other cards used during that time. A lot of decks either relied on search-based supporter cards like Guzma and Hala, which lets you search your deck for a stadium card and put it into your hand. Or alternatively, if you discard two cards to play the card, it would also allow you to search a Pokemon tool or a special energy card in addition to the stadium card. Another popular search supporter was Green Exploration, a card that lets you search your deck for two trainer cards as long as you don't have any Pokemon with abilities in play. Decks that weren't using these search cards use supporter cards like Welder and Cynthia and Caitlyn. Welder lets you attach up to two fire energies from your hand to one of your Pokemon in play and draws three cards afterwards. Cynthia and Caitlyn puts a supporter card, other than a different copy of Cynthia and Caitlyn, from your discard pile back into your hand, but can additionally draw three cards if you decide to discard a card from your hand when playing it. The card you discarded can also not be picked up from the first part of Cynthia and Caitlyn's effect. So, in terms of raw draw power, Erika wasn't even that bad during that time. What makes her horrible, however, is the fact that your opponent gets to draw cards as well. Any card that gives advantage to your opponent in the Pokemon TCG either has to be so incredibly powerful for the player using it that the downsides of helping your opponent doesn't really matter, or it has to immediately end the game so your opponent never gets a chance to use the card they gained access to. And just drawing three cards isn't a powerful enough effect to ever fit into these criteria. And at number two, we've got Riley from Sword and Shield Lost Origin. When you play this card, you reveal the top five cards of your deck to your opponent. Then they get to choose two of them that you have to discard, and the remaining cards are then put into your hand. Unlike many of the other cards in this list, this might not immediately strike everyone as a horrible effect. But if we take a deeper look at it, it should become relatively clear why this card made it onto this list. Cards that look at the top X cards and require some kind of choice actually have a fantastic track record in the TCG of being viable. Sage's training from Heart, Gold, and Soul Silver Undaunted lets you look at the top five cards of your deck. You get to pick two of them and the rest are discarded. While this card wasn't universally useful at the time, many decks that just needed the extra consistency and often didn't mind discarding some cards, or in some cases even had cards in their deck that they wanted to have in the discard pile, would make great use of it. A more recent example is Calrissa's Experiment from the same set as Riley, Lost Origin. Just like Sage's Training, it lets you look at the top five cards. This time, you get to choose three of them to keep and the remaining cards are put into the Lost Zone instead of the discard pile. Cards that enter the Lost Zone can't be used for the rest of the game but just like Dax could turn the discard aspect of Sage's training into a benefit instead of a disadvantage. Many powerful cards are released alongside Colorus' experiment required you to have a certain amount of cards in your Lost Zone to be used, meaning that this card doesn't just provide consistency, but also enables a lot of cards in your deck. Riley, on the other hand, isn't just a worse version of these cards, it's borderline unplayable. If you only had to reveal the cards to your opponent so they would see your picks, the cards would still be decent. Getting a look at the top 5 cards and picking 3 of them to get into your hand at the cost of your opponent getting some extra knowledge would not be ideal, but could potentially enable some decks that don't mind giving extra knowledge to your opponent. What makes the card awful is that your opponent gets to choose which cards you have to discard. This could potentially mean that you lose key parts of your deck or match up relevant tech cards that you can't afford to get rid of. On top of your opponent getting extra knowledge about the cards you have access to makes it one of the worst supporter cards ever especially because it can actively cause you to lose. And at number one, we have Imakuni from X and Y Generations. This card has a very simple effect of just confusing your active Pokemon when it's used. Confuse is a condition where Pokemon has to flip heads to attack or else take 30 damage instead. Before we get into Imakuni, we should take a look at the set that it came in as X and Y Generations was not a regular expansion to the Pokemon TCG. For the 20th anniversary Pokemon in 2016, a special set was released that primarily featured Pokemon from the Kanto region and reprinted some of the item cards from the X and Y block. It was not sold in booster box like regular sets, instead Generations was the first western set that was only sold in promo boxes. Like most of the newer non-booster box sets, Generations also featured some items and supporter cards that were completely new. Some of them, like Revitalizer, an item card that puts two grass Pokemon from a discard pile to your hand, were playable cards that eventually found the way into decks that could make good use of it. On the other side, we got Imakuni, a card clearly designed to be a joke and not for competitive play. To show how useless this card actually is, we need to take a look at its effect a bit closer. The Pokemon TCG has five different status conditions. Poison puts one damage counter on the effect of Pokemon between turns, Burn puts two damage counters on Pokemon between turns, but also has the user of the Pokemon flip a coin to see if the status condition gets removed. Sleep and Paralyze make the Pokemon unable to attack, with Sleep flipping a coin between each turn, 
just like Burn to see the status condition is removed, and Paralyze always getting removed after one turn. Lastly, Confusion has the use of the Pokemon flip a coin before attacking. If the flip ends up heads, the attack continues normally, and Tails places three damage counters of Pokemon, and the attack isn't used. None of these status conditions are anything that you would want on your Pokemon, but under certain circumstances, putting a status condition onto your Pokemon could actually be beneficial. Abilities that require Pokemon to be affected by a status condition in exchange for more powerful attacks could make use of cards that apply special conditions to your own Pokemon. Another useful way could be an ability that basically copies special conditions onto the opponent's Pokemon. For example, if you use Imakuni on a Pokemon like that, your opponent's Pokemon would now also be confused. Even with these potential scenarios in mind, Imakuni is one of the worst supporters of all time, as putting confusion onto your own Pokemon almost always makes your attacks a 50% chance to miss and deal 30 damage to your own Pokemon. And even the copy abilities would simply be too much effort just to put a special condition onto your opponent's active Pokemon that could easily be removed by something as simple as retreating. However, if we take a look at the backstory of Imakuni's design, it becomes very clear that he was made very bad on purpose. While this Imakuni card is the first we've ever seen of him in the West, Japanese players are very familiar with him, as he was created shortly after the TCG's release over there. From 1997 to 2002, he was part of many promotional live events in Japan, and also received more than 10 cards that featured his character to some degree. One of these cards is Imakuni's Doduo, a card we got shortly after Generations was released in X of Y Evolutions. Imakuni was clearly put into Generations as a joke and purposefully made bad, which made it even easier to put him onto this list. Consider that most of the other cards weren't even designed to be bad like this one was. Level X Pokemon were unique in that they could level up Pokemon of the same name to give them a new host of abilities on top of their previous ones as well as a slight health boost. So in this video we'll be going over the best Pokemon with this mechanic. And at 10th place is one of the most unique Pokemon ever printed on a card. Porygon Z Level X. This card does not have a single attack printed on it, but instead features two different Poke powers on it showing the unique way Level X can work since they are still able to use any attack of their non-level up version. Mode Crash can be used when this card gets put into play and discards any kind of special energy attached to your opponent's Pokemon, something that wasn't particularly useful back when it was around, but still a nice additional option nevertheless. This card's second Poke Power is where things get interesting. Decode allows a player to pick any two cards from the deck and place them on top, making them easily accessible with any kind of draw card. And then the best part is, you can use it every single turn, turning every Porygon Z deck into an insanely consistent build. Its uniqueness and power to get the player any card in a format where powerful draw cards were scarce is what gets Porygon Z level X its number 10 spot. And at number 9, we have Magnezone level X, a card that heavily benefited from multiple good Magnezone cards being available to it, but also having an incredibly useful ability. Electric Trans allows you to move lightning or metal energies from any of your Pokemon to a different one, as often as you'd like. This card's Cyber Shock attack deals 80 damage and paralyzes your opponent's active Pokemon at the mandatory cost of discarding one metal and one lightning energy from Magnezone level X. Paralysis in the Pokemon TCG renders a Pokemon useless because that Pokemon can't retreat or attack for a full cycle of turns. These two parts already make this card a solid attacker and utility provider, but it gets even better when you take a look at Magnezone's cards that it is able to utilize. When Magnezone level X was first released in Legends Awakened, it only had access to Magnezone from Diamond and Pearl, which provided free retreat to any Pokemon that had at least one metal energy attached to it with its magnetized Pokebody. Its attack Metal Blast dealt 50 damage, plus an additional 10 for each metal energy attached to it. This made for a rough start of Magnezone level X's playability, but that would quickly change when Stormfront was released. Stormfront immediately brought two new Magnezones to the game, who both carried useful attacks and Poke powers. The metal type Magnezone allows you to gain access to your energies with its Poke power Magnetic Search to grab either a lightning or metal energy to your hand. The most commonly used Magnezone at the time, however, was lightning type Magnezone from the same set, as it provided consistent energy acceleration, which became especially powerful with Magnezone level X's power to move them around. Super Connectivity attaches a lightning or metal energy to your active Pokemon at the cost of one damage counter that would be placed in the Pokemon that would receive the energy. Keep it in mind that with two Magnezones, this Poke Power would be able to be used twice, which meant that Magnezone level X could paralyze your opponent's active Pokemon every turn without ever requiring a hand attachment. But Magnezone didn't just provide an amazing Poke Power, it also came with a useful attack. Gyro Ball dealt 60 damage and gave the player the option to switch both active Pokemon with a bench one giving the respective player the choice of what to promote. For a long time, these options were all that Magnezone decks were using, until Triumphant, where the most powerful card for the deck, was released. Magnezone Prime came with an incredibly consistent Poke Power, Magnetic Draw, that let the player draw until they had 6 cards in hand, as well as the powerful attack, Lost Burn, that put any number of energies attached to any of your Pokemon into the Lost Zone, and dealt 50 damage for each of them. Cards that enter the Lost Zone are removed from play for the rest of the game. Funnily enough, by the time this card was released, so much time had passed that Magnezone Level X and Magnezone Prime were equal in HP, getting rid of the Level X function of providing extra HP. While it was never the best deck in any of its formats, Magnezone was certainly one of the most creative and solid archetypes that deserves its spot on this list. 
And at number 8 is a card that played a key role in the most unique archetype that has ever been printed in the Pokemon TCG, Arceus Level X. Arceus expansion in the Platinum era of the Pokemon TCG featured, who would have guessed it, a bunch of Arceus cards, creating a unique deck with many different attackers. What made the Arceus deck so unique is that there was no limitation on the amount of Arceus cards that you could put into your deck, getting rid of the usual amount of 4 copies per deck. This meant the archetype would not have to decide on which types of Arceus cards to bring, but could actually play all of them. In addition to a regular Arceus card for every type, they also received 3 different Arceus level X cards. All of them were colorless, but shared the Pokebody multi-type, which changed their type to one of the cards that they had evolved from, allowing you to pick which type would be best suited for the matchup. On top of that, the version that made it onto this list had a second Pokebody called Omniscient, which made it possible for it to use any attack from any other Arceus in play, as long as the correct energies were attached to it. This provided the deck with a lot of different options and made it one of the most interesting decks to ever exist. Gengar Level X is another card that heavily benefited from being able to access multiple different good Gengar cards, putting it at 7th place on this list. In a game that was heavily dominated by Level X Pokemon, this card's level down Pokepower was a great offensive tool to secure easier knockouts. This Pokepower would allow the player to pick one of their opponent's Level X Pokemon and shovel the level up card back into their deck. Gengar Level X's attacks also isn't anything to scoff at. For the heavy cost of 3 energies, Compound Pain put 30 damage onto every opposing Pokemon that already had any damage counters on it. This worked especially well with Gengar from Arceus that can move one damage counter from one opponent's Pokemon to another one once per turn with its Curse Poke Power. The Shadow Skip attack also helped with setting up multiple Pokemon by dealing 60 damage to the active Pokemon and putting 10 damage on a bench Pokemon that your opponent controlled. Gengar from Storefront was a bit dated when Level X came out, but the combination of these two cards breathed new life into it. Fainting Spell was one of the best Poke Powers at the time flipping a coin when this card would be knocked out and taking the attacker with it if the coin landed heads. Shadow Room was another attack that Gengar could access to put damage counters on your opponent's side, placing 3 damage counters on any Pokemon, or twice as much of the Pokemon that damage would be on had a Poke Power. And lastly, as if Gengar Level X didn't already have enough great options to evolve from, is Gengar Prime from Triumphant, which once again carried another attack that would set up damage counters. Curse Drop placed 4 damage counters on the opposing side in any way the player liked, making it an ideal tool to set up multiple Pokemon at once for Compound Pain. All of these attack options and an already great card itself put Gengar Level X amongst the best cards of the time and onto this list. Sixth place goes to the oldest card in this list, Gardevoir Level X, released in Secret Wonders, one of the first Diamond and Pearl expansions. This card brought some utility to an already powerful archetype with its teleportation Poke Power. Teleportation switched Gardevoir Level X with one of your bench Pokemon if it was active, or your active Pokemon if it was still on the bench. Its Bring Down attack was not a focus point, but still provided some niche uses by knocking out the Pokemon in play with the lowest amount of HP remaining. It's important to keep in mind that this attack does not specify that it has to be in an opposing Pokemon, meaning you could knock out your own Pokemon as well. The attack's main use was to finish off Pokemon that were previously in the active spot, but have since been switched out or retreated. Secret Wonders also brought a regular Gardevoir card that some players still consider to have been the most dominant deck ever in the history of the game. The Telepass Pokepower was able to copy a supporter card from your opponent's discard pile, offering a second use of a supporter card every turn to the Gardevoir player. The Pokepower was so powerful that it specifies in its card text that only one Telepass Pokepower could be used per turn. Gardevoir's attack Psychic Lock was the focus point of the deck, dealing 60 damage which was enough to knock out most Pokemon in two hits, and preventing your opponent from using any Pokepowers during the next turn, heavily limiting what kind of options were available to the locked player. Gardevoir Level X was a great addition to the deck that ended up winning the 2008 World Championship. In 5th place we've got Regigigas Level X, a powerhouse with a unique strategy. This card's Sacrifice Poke Power is incredibly powerful if it's used correctly. At the cost of knocking out one of your own Pokemon, it attached 2 basic energy cards to Regigigas from the discard pile and removed 8 damage counters from it, providing a way to set up Regigigas Level X. And it also kept it alive at the same time. The Pokemon that were knocked out were usually support Pokemon that had already fulfilled their purpose, freeing up bench space for other uses. The card's Giga Blaster was also a large reason for its spawn this list. For the high amount of 4 energies, Giga Blaster did 100 damage, discarded the top card of their deck, and one of their cards in their hand. It also prevented Regigigas level X from using its attack next turn, which was fine as the regular Regigiga still provided some useful attacks. Dragoff did 30 damage with the option to switch to defending Pokemon with the bench one before doing damage, and Giga Hammer did 80 damage, plus it couldn't be used on the next turn, just like Giga Blaster. The goal for Regigigas decks was simple but effective. Set up one big Regigigas level X and keep it alive by sacrificing support Pokemon that would either help the player draw cards or disrupt the opponent. This unique playstyle and Regigigas sheer power make it an easy addition to this list. And at number 4 we have Flygon level X from Rising Rivals. This card's Pokebody Wind Erosion discard the top card of your opponent's deck between each turn, making it possible to get rid of some of their key resources by chance, while using Flygon level X to attack with. 
Extreme Attack was an incredible tool to take care of opposing level X, dealing 150 damage to them no matter if they were the active or on the bench. This card and its previous stages were a key pillar of many decks across the time due to their colorless typing and helping them gain different attackers and also some utility thanks to Flygon's Rainbow Float Pokebody, which gave free retreat to any Pokemon that shared the type with an energy that was attached to Flygon itself. One of the most successful strategies, however, didn't involve attacking with either of the two Flygons, but instead made use of the Poke Tool card Memory Berry, which allowed a Pokemon to use any attack of a previous stage, even the basic. The attacker of choice was Trap Inch from Secret Wonders that could use either its attack Inviting Trap to switch a bench Pokemon with the opposing active Pokemon, or Sand Tomb to deal 10 damage and prevent the Pokemon from retreating. This, in combination with Flygon Level X's Wind Erosion Pokebody, meant that the deck would be able to slowly chip away the top card of your opponent's deck each turn until they eventually run out of cards. This is one of the first ever mill slash control decks that use a different strategy than the common practices of taking six prize cards. Its inclusion in many top and rogue decks alike made Flygon Level X a very popular card at the time, giving it a well-deserved fourth place. And at number three, we have Garchomp C Level X. Healing Breath was an amazing Poke Power that allowed the player, upon evolving Garchomp C, to heal all damage from any SP Pokemon they had in play, making it very hard for decks that weren't able to knock out SP attackers in one hit. Garchomp C Level X wasn't just a utility tool, it also was one of the best attackers the deck had to offer. Its Dragon Rush attack dealt 80 damage to any Pokemon at the cost of discarding two energies, something that became very easy once it gained access to double colorless energy in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, fulfilling the entire cost with only one special energy. This in combination with Energy Gain, an SP Pokemon specific tool card that removed one colorless cost from any attack of the SP Pokemon it was attached to, made it a powerful and energy efficient threat to most decks. Up until Double Colorless Energy was released, this card was mainly used for its Poke Power, or powered up with Bronzong G's Galactic Switch Poke Power that allowed the player to move an energy from SP Pokemon to another Pokemon by putting 10 damage onto Bronzong G. One way to gain access to multiple energies at once during the time was Upper Energy from Rising Rivals. It worked just like Double Colorless Energy, as long as the player using it had taken fewer prize cards than their opponent. This was a solid option at the time, but became obsolete when Double Colorless Energy entered the game. Ever since Garchamp C Level X was printed, it was part of some of the best decks, being solidified by its World Championship win in 2010. To wander the legacy, Pokemon even gave it a spot in their 25th anniversary set, Celebrations. And at number 2 in this list, it might be surprising to some people, especially after featuring so many great attacking options in the last couple of entries. And that of course is Uxie Level X, which doesn't earn its spot by being a strong attacking threat, but thanks to its additional consistency that it provides. The card's trade-off Poke Power lets the player take a look at the top two cards of the deck and put one into their hand, while the other one would be put at the bottom. Being able to use this Poke Power once every turn helped decks a lot to gain extra cards and get closer to enabling their strategies. A large part of its utility was also played by Uxie and its setup Poke Power. Setup let the player draw cards until they had seven cards in their hand when Uxie was in play, making it a staple in most decks thanks to its amazing draw power. Even nowadays, cards aren't given abilities as powerful as Setup. Crobat V, for example, only draws up to six cards, can only be used once per turn, and gives up two easy prize cards if it's knocked out, due to its V rule. This would make Uxie an incredibly powerful card even in today's meta, showing why the combination of Uxie and Uxie Level X gets a very well-deserved second place on this list. And at number one, we have Luxray GL Level X. With its bright look Poke Power, the player can switch one of their opponent's bench Pokemon with their active one. Gusting has always been an important part of the Pokemon TCG, and the combination of this powerful Poke Power with cards from the SP archetype like Poke Turn, which picks up an SP Pokemon and all cards attached to it, this would make it possible to reuse Bright Look by allowing the player to evolve another Luxray GL that was already in play, or wait another turn to evolve the one that was placed back into the player's hand. Similar Poke Powers or abilities have been reprinted since, and all of them have seen play. Cards like Lycanroc GX and Umbreon VMAX had high impacts on their metagames, even with other item or support cards around that fulfilled similar purposes. Luxray had none of these to compete with, making it the only reliable option to force your opponent into switching out their active Pokemon with the Pokemon of your choice. But this wasn't everything good about Luxray GL Level X. What might not seem like a lot nowadays, being able to quickly deal 60 damage with its flash impact attack was a useful option to knock out low HP Pokemon, or set up knockouts for future turns. Once again, the SP engine played a big role in that, by allowing this card to be used for one less energy by attaching the energy gain tool card to it, which reduced the attack cost of the SP Pokemon it was attached to by one. Even at the time, Luxray Geo Level X was considered the most powerful Level X card by many, solidified by its two World Championship wins in 2009 and 2010. Just like Garchomp C Level X, it got an honorary printing Pokemon's 25th anniversary set, Celebrations. Throughout the history of the Pokemon TCG, there have been a variety of unique gimmick mechanics introduced to make the game more interesting. Many of the game's earliest gimmicks either flopped or were too short-lived to have a meaningful impact on the game's history. This would change with the release of EX Ruby and Sapphire, which introduced Pokemon EX to the game. 
These powerful new cards were meta-defining for their entire legality, warping the mid-2000s metagame around themselves. And in this list, we'll be going over examining the best of these powerful Pokemon. And at number 10, we have Blaziken EX from EX Team Magma vs. Team Aqua expansion. Blaziken EX was the perfect example of why the Pokemon TCG's evolution mechanic is so interesting, as it was one of the first times that coincidentally, evolving from the same stage 1 as one of the best cards already in the game had a dramatic impact on the metagame. Boasting 150 HP, Blaziken already was poised to be one of the strongest attackers in the game. But Volcanic Ash wound up not just being a strong attack, but arguably the best attack in the entire 2004 modified format. For 2 fire and 2 colorless energy, Volcanic Ash allows you to target down one of your opponent's Pokemon and deal 100 damage to it, at the cost of discarding 2 energies attached to Blaziken. At the time, this 100 damage was enough to take out pretty much every Pokemon in the format, including some Pokemon EX, resulted in easy prize cards and the ability to cripple a setup with ease. However, where this expensive attack really drew its strength was from the Blaziken from the EX Ruby and Sapphire, which allowed you to attach fire energy from your discard pile to your bench Pokemon. Thanks to this Poke Power, Blaziken decks at the time would repeatedly attach energy to bench Blaziken EX, and then once it had enough energy to attack, often with some surplus energy, they would use Volcanic Ash two turns in a row with each Blaziken EX, guaranteeing that they at least break even on the prize trade and oftentimes resulted in favorable traits. This strategy proved to be so strong that it finished in second place at the 2004 World Championships, but its lack of success in the subsequent years held it back from landing higher on this list. And at number 9, we have Vaporeon EX. Released in EX Delta Species, Vaporeon quickly ascended to being one of the most powerful Pokemon EX in the game at the time of its release. While its attacks are not exceptional, its Pokepower Evolutionary Swirl became a significant aspect of all formats that the card remained legal in. Upon evolving into Vaporeon, Evolutionary Swirl gave you the option to force your opponent to shuffle their hand into their deck and just draw four cards. At the time, this level of disruption was rare to see on a trainer card, but seeing something like this as a Pokepower was unheard of. The EX formats, specifically 2007, are well known for players having rather large hand sizes, and as a result, the simple Pokepower could instantly cripple any sort of combo that your opponent may have been trying to set up. At the time of its release, Rocket's Admin, which makes each player shuffle their hand into the deck and draw a number of cards up to the number of the remaining prize cards, was still legal in the modified format. But once it rotated in 2007, there was no longer a way to disrupt your opponent's hand. So many aggressive decks default on using the group of Pokemon EX that evolved from Eevee, known as the Evolutions, as an engine with disruption with Vaporeon as their centerpiece. Vaporeon would end up being so strong that it got second place in the 2006 World Championships and then won the title in 2007, the only two years that the card was legal, proving that it had more than what it takes to be one of the greats. With that being said, the card probably would not have seen nearly as much play if it wasn't for the strength of the other Evolutions, which holds it back from being even higher on this list. And at number 8, we have Jirachi EX from the EX Crystal Guardians expansion. Released at the very end of the EX era, Jirachi quickly made a name for itself in the modified formats of 2007 and 2008. Its most important attack, Shield Beam, allowed it to do just 30 damage for one Psychic and one Colorless Energy, but it also prevented your opponent from using Poke Powers during the next turn. Despite its powerful effect, Shield Beam normally would not have gotten much use in the format, but thanks to its Poke Body Starlight, Shield Beam costs just one Psychic Energy if your opponent has a Pokemon EX or Stage 2 Evolution Pokemon in play changing Jirachi from a slow disruption tool to being a powerful early game lockdown option that your opponent was forced to deal with. Jirachi was so strong that it won the world championship in both of the years that it was legal, but each of these strategies used it slightly differently. In 2007, the championship deck used Jirachi as a method of slowing down their opponent so they could build up a board of threats before going on the offense, as opposed to the 2008 deck, which used Jirachi as an offensive threat that your opponent was forced to knock out, which would result in them activating scrambled energy, turning it into three energy instead of just one thanks to its effect, so the player could effectively attack with Gardevoir, resulting in your opponent being locked out of Poke Powers for the entire game. And at number 7, we have Metacham EX from the EX Emerald expansion. This card is the perfect combination of incredible attack and an even better Poke Body, creating a nearly perfect card. Its Poke Body in particular was extremely powerful, shutting off the Poke Powers of all non EX Pokemon as long as it was your active Pokemon, meaning that it shut off cards like Pidgeot and Mad Cargo, both of which were incredibly important to the consistency of decks in the 2005 modified format. As for its attacks, Pure Power placed just 3 damage counters on your opponent's Pokemon for 2 colorless energy, and Sky Kick lets you do 60 damage plus 30 more if the defending Pokemon had resistance to fighting type Pokemon, effectively negating that resistance. At the time, Metacham EX was the final iteration of a series of archetypes called Turn 2 decks, which were typically made of thick Stage 1 lines of the player's choosing and very few, if any, other Pokemon. First popularized after it went undefeated at a regional championship in 2005, the Turn 2 decks dominated the 2005 format. At the 2005 National Championship, Metacham EX won all three age divisions, 
Not just that, but Metacham EX also won two of the Age Divisions, only failing to win in the Masters Division because many players added hard counters to strategy in their decks after its dominant performance at the National Championships. Following 2005, things started to go sour for Metacham EX, and it never put up results like this again, causing it to land at only the 7th spot on this list. And at number 6, we have Rayquaza EX from the EX Dragon Frontiers expansion. Rayquaza is another example of a perfect card, with two extremely strong attacks and an even stronger Pokebody. First, Rayquaza's special circuit allows it to do 30 damage to any of your opponent's Pokemon for a Lightning and Colorless, but this becomes 50 of the Pokemon you choose as a Poke Power or a Poke Body. Rayquaza also has Sky High Claws, which does 70 damage for two Lightning and two Colorless Energy, which normally would be way too expensive for that level of damage. But thanks to Rayquaza's Rage Aura, as long as you have more prize cards remaining than your opponent, you ignore all Colorless Energy and Rayquaza's attack costs, making Sky High Claws a highly potent offensive threat. Rayquaza was a core part of the deck that won the 2007 World Championship, even being the featured card on the front of the package of the version of the deck that you could buy in stores later that year. However, Rayquaza's success does not come as much from the format as much as it does from the EX Ruby and Sapphire to EX Power Keepers format, also known as the EX era format, as it contained all of the sets that were released in the EX era. This format never was played in the TPCI rating zones, but it was in the format in Japan at the time. In recent years, many players have hosted unofficial tournaments in this format to relive a format that we never got to see in the TCPI rating zones, and in that format, Rayquaza is a namesake for a deck called Railer, which is one of the most dominant archetypes in that format. And at number 5, we have Rocket Sneasel EX from EX Team Rocket Returns expansion. Dragoff and Dark Ring are both exceptionally strong attacks despite their seemingly low damage output. But thanks to Darkness Energy and R Energy, Rocket Sneasel is able to use both of these attacks to deal heavier damage. Dragoff is typically used in the earlier stages of the game to try and disrupt your opponent's strategy, or to soften up a Pokemon that may not have much HP that you would normally be able to handle with Dark Ring. Speaking of Dark Ring, it has a base damage of just 30 damage, but it does 10 more damage for each Darkness type Pokemon that you have in play. But once again, Darkness Energy and R Energy help to reach for extra damage as needed. Rocket Sneasels was the main attacker in the archetype called Dragtrode, named after Dark Dragonite, which allowed you to move around energy attached to your Pokemon in play, and Dark Electrode, which attaches energy to itself from the deck, both of which were also from the EX Team Rocket Returns expansion. The synergy of all of these powerful Pokemon made for an incredibly aggressive archetype that was extremely difficult for many decks to handle at the time. Despite it not putting up many results in the 2005 World Championships, largely thanks to Medicham EX shutting the deck down, Dragtrode would prove to be an extremely dominant force in the 2006 modified format, taking multiple spots in the top 32 of the World Championships and solidifying its name as one of the greatest decks of all time. And at number 4, we have Electrode EX from the EX Fire Red and Leaf Green expansion. This card is not particularly known for its attack, as it was quite mediocre, but its pokey power is arguably one of the most powerful in the entire EX era. Extra Energy Bomb forces Electro to knock itself out, giving your opponent two prize cards in exchange for attaching five energy cards from your discard pile to your Pokemon in any way you like, excluding Pokemon EX. An important distinction here is that Extra Energy Bomb says energy cards, meaning that it can also attach special energy like Scramble Energy. In addition to attaching a ton of energy cards, the prize cards that you give your opponent are also very important, as it activates the effect of Scramble Energy and POW hand expansion, as well as reduce the number of cards your opponent will draw off of Rocket's admin. Electrode was the centerpiece of a group of archetypes focusing on abusing these interactions. The most successful of which was pairing with Dark Tyranitar, which was typically called Bomtar. Bomtar was first played at the 2005 World Championships, where it got second place. But it also saw extensive success through 2006 and took many spots in the top 32 of the 2006 World Championship, as well as being one of the most dominant decks in the full EX era format. Electrode also saw playing a variety of other partners, including Zapdos EX, Rayquaza EX, and many others throughout its legality, solidifying just how strong the card really was. And at number 3, we have Blastoise EX from the EX Fire Red and Leaf Green expansion. Reminiscent of the original Blastoise card from the Pokemon TCG's base set, Blastoise EX's Energy Rain allows you to attach as many water energy to your Pokemon as you like during your turn, at the cost of placing one damage counter, or the equivalent to 10 damage, on that Pokemon. Energy Rain was of course designed to power up a variety of water type Pokemon, including its own Hyper Whirlpool attack, which does 80 damage and makes you flip a coin until you get Tails and discard an energy from your opponent's active Pokemon for each hex. However, with the release of EX Delta Species, Holon Pokemon, a series of Pokemon which were treated as energy cards were introduced. In particular, Holon's Magneton, Holon's Electrode, and Holon's Cast Form were especially important because they all allowed you to attach them as any two type of energy in exchange for returning an energy attached to that Pokemon to your hand. This opened up a plethora of new options for Blastoise, as now you could attach infinite water energy, use a Holon Pokemon to fill up your two non colorless energy in any attack, effectively opening up the ability to attack with any Pokemon in the game at the time. For this strategy, the iconic LBS, or Lugia Blastoise Steelix was born, 
focusing around Blastoise to power Blue Gear EX and Steelix EX to abuse their extremely powerful attacks. In 2006, this deck was an extremely dominant force. It was considered to be the deck to beat for most of its legality, which is one of the main reasons the deck was not as successful as one would expect at the US National Championships in the 2006 World Championships. But it did still put up some solid results. However, the deck's power level is almost universally recognized as being one of the most powerful decks relative to its format of all time. And at number 2, we have Jolteon EX from EX Delta Species. Another one of the evolutions that were mentioned when talking about Vaporeon EX earlier on this list, Jolteon is certainly the evolution that brought the evolution package the most success. Its evolutionary Thunder Poku power placed one damage counter on each of your opponent's Pokemon, and when used multiple times was the perfect way to set up big swings with its second bite attack which for one lightning and one colorless energy does 20 damage plus 10 more damage for each damage counter in your defending Pokemon. Throughout its legality, Jolteon saw use in a couple of different ways, varying from fixing numbers in the Evolution decks that got second place in the 2006 World Championship to being a critical source of damage in the centerpiece of the 2007 US National Championships and 2007 World Championships Absolutions decks, which use Absol EX to both spread and move damage counters for big second bite plates. The level of success that this card saw during its legality as a core part of numerous strategies is nearly unmatched by any card in the time period, except, of course, by the number one spot on this list. And at number one, we have Mew EX from the EX Legend Maker expansion. This card is extremely simple, with its versatile Pokebody allowing it to copy the attacks of any Pokemon at play, as long as it has the necessary energy to use the attack. With a Pokebody like this, Mew is one of the most, well, versatile attackers in the game. The card saw play in an unbelievable number of strategies, many of which appeared on this list. Decks like Dragtrode, LBS, and Absolutions, and more all played with this card. With the release of the Holin Pokemon, Mew was given even more options as it could now easily have all types of energy attached to it, making it more of an issue of quantity of energy rather than type matching. Mew was only legal for Worlds in 2006 and 2007 and was a core part of the championship strategy in both of those years. Not just that, but it also saw top level results at national championships across the world. It also must be noted that there was a deck in 2006 called Mewlock, which featured Wobbuffet and Jinx. That is often cited as one of the best decks ever built. But it was never viable for tournaments because games would take too long, so it never got to put up the results to prove that claim. Mew is far and away the most flexible card on this list, being used in top level strategies for the card's entire legality, and easily cemented its place as the best Pokemon EX of all time. 